Um, welcome to the Sacramento Valley Tree Crop IPM webinar. We're going to begin in just a second, but before we begin, I'm going to go over some of the meeting logistics. Um, so how do you participate today? Uh, there are two ways to participate. The Q&A function should be at the bottom here. Um, that's how where we want you to put questions. So if a speaker is presenting and you have a particular question for that speaker, go ahead and click on the Q&A function and type it in there. It's also very helpful if you type the speaker's name. Um, it's okay if you forget, but it's helpful that way we know exactly which speaker you're directing. Um, generally speaking, by the topic, we'll able to know who it's directed to, but it's helpful if you put their, um, their information in there. Don't add any questions into the chat. Um, they might be missed. Um, use chat for comments and discussion and make sure you drop it down to all panelists attendees so that everyone can see your chat. Um, continuing education, we have two different types. We have California Department of Pesticide Regulation, DPR. Those are for the private applicators or the uh, PCAs or the, you know, all of those categories. We have a half hour in laws, two hours in other. You need to be logged on for the duration of the entire um, event. We'll be checking um, to make sure. Uh, I will verify your attendance in order to get the full credit. If you're joining us late or, you know, leave early, that's still fine. You'll get the credit for where you were um, attending. Uh, there will also be poll questions after every presentation. Make sure you answer those. Um, if for some reason you can't because you're having issues with pop-ups, you can you can put some answers in the chat that will verify that you are there and, and participating. Also, at the end of the event, I will email um, an exam that you need to take within one week, um, and you have to pass with 70%. And if you don't pass, don't worry, you get a second chance. Um, just to note, if you have like three people sitting in front of your computer right now, only one person can get credit per device, so make sure two other people call in on the phone and we can use their phone number to verify their attendance. CCA is a bit easier. We have 2.5 hours in pest management. A QR code will be displayed at the uh, end of the event. And then you just scan it with the CCA app on your phone. And if you don't have the app, you just have to email your CCA number um, to ANR program support at ucanr.edu. I'll go over all of this at the end of the meeting again, no worries. But for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Kat and she is going to get us started. Okay, great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so welcome everyone. Excited to have everybody here. Um, this is a joint meeting put on by myself, Luke Milliron and Franz Niederholzer uh, to serve the needs of IPM interested folks in the Sac Valley. What we're hoping to do this morning is, you know, spend a little time reflecting on the season that's passed and what lessons we can learn from that. And also, you know, prepare ourselves for the season to come. Um, <clears throat> we have some great speaker, oh, and get some DPR credits, which have been very hard to get during uh, COVID with all the meetings shutting down and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so we have some great speakers today. Um, and very excited to have them here and great, grateful for them having made the time. Uh, most of them have big assignments of the whole state or at least the whole Central Valley. So we're grateful that they carved out time to for us in there, but especially wanted to give a shout out to David Havilan, who does not have responsibilities up here at all and has carved out time in his schedule um, because we're still filling the void of Emily Sims. Um, who we have been approved to get a new person in that position, but we haven't started the hiring process yet for that. Um, so yeah, so let's see. With that, I'll just hand it over to David. David, take it away. All right, well, good deal. Let's get the share screen going here. And there we go. Whoa, take home messages. Let's not go to that first. There we go. Well, good morning. Yeah, so thank, thanks for the invitation, Kat. And yeah, you're right. I, I don't have responsibilities in the Sacramento Valley, but at the same time, I, I do have you know a fair amount of experience with spider mites and um, particularly in, walmond, in, in almonds. Um, but it's good to be able to share this information. There's, you know, there are certainly regional differences in, in mites and mite pressure, but as far as uh, the, you know, some of the basic biology and the principles that go into mite management, uh, those principles are fairly universal. And as I said, the, the majority of this talk is going to be about almonds, but I am going to try and make it something that, that the walnut growers will be able to think about and, and process um, as they're, they're trying to manage the, the same particular pest. 
Um, you know, the first thing I'm just going to say is I'm an IPM guy. Okay, if, if you're if you're wanting this to be a half an hour, which pesticide do I spray talk? That's not what it is because mite management's a lot more than that. And and frankly, the miticides they're all good. Um, you know, every miticide, if you spray it on a mite with good coverage, works well. Um, the issue typically is, is coverage, not the product itself, especially when you're talking about walnuts. But, you know, in, in the almond side, you monitor each week, you monitor for the mites, you monitor also for natural enemies. There's treatment thresholds established. I'm going to talk about those and how those were developed. And then you treat if you need to. But I want to start off with just a real principle here. And let me just ask a simple question. Imagine you've got, you know, imagine you've got two mites per leaf, and I don't even care what crop it is. If you've got two mites per leaf, if I were to ask the question, if two mites per leaf, should you apply a miticide? What would your answer be? Hey, I know you can't answer, but just think about that. Two mites per leaf, should I treat? Well, hopefully every one of you, the answer you gave was, it depends. And let me tell you why that should be the answer. If you've got two mites per leaf, but there's 30 good bugs, you know, there's every good bug you can imagine, there's 30 of them on every leaf with only two mites. Should you treat? Of course not, because your mites are going to disappear. If you have the same two mites per leaf and zero natural enemies, should you treat? Now you should be really worried because that two is going to become 10 and then it become 100 and, and you're going to get an exponential growth. So the point I want to make is with mite management, the number of mites is only part of the picture. Okay, If you want to know how many mites there are, you count mites. But if you want to know whether that mite population is going to go up, down, or stay the same, you have to know what's going on with biological control and the natural enemies. So you'll see that theme kind of permeate through my talk today, because I really do believe that. So you know, sampling on the almond side, you know, early on the season, start in the crotches of the trees, stay in the hot spots. You want random leaves. 15 leaves per tree, you know, more is always better, but you're always looking for good bugs and bad bugs. And the form on the page I showed you before, if you want to use it from the university is great. Um, it'll, it'll walk you through the numbers and help you come to a decision of whether or not you need to treat. But I do want to introduce, uh, before I go further, the, the good bugs you should be looking for. And the first one is a Western predatory mite or other phytoceids. Okay? Phytoceidae is the family of mites that, that all these beneficial mites belong to. And the way you can tell a predatory mite is they've got a, a teardrop shape. Uh, if you look at the picture on the top left there, you can see it's pointed on the right, on the head side. It's got a round um, abdomen side. Um, so you know, it's not oval, it's literally a teardrop. Uh, typically they're a clear to red color. Uh, they're, they're sort of shiny in appearance because they have very few seedy, you know, very few hairs on them. And very commonly you'll see them running around. Um, you know, the predators, they're chasing things. They're not just you know, they're not just leaching onto a, a, you know, a leaf surface to suck out the contents of a cell. So very, very active. So watch for them. Um, anytime that I've been in the Sacramento Valley, um, I've seen these very commonly, particularly in walnuts. Um, very, very common. Uh, and oftentimes on the undersides of leaves. Now, second predator that I'll talk, a uh, talk about a decent amount is one that's not known as well. Um, it's called six spotted thrips. And these mites, they feed, um, or the thrips feeds almost exclusively on spider mites. They really like hot, dry climates. Uh, from the literature, they can eat 50 eggs in a day at 86 Fahrenheit. Uh, so we know that they'll eat more than that as the weather is warmer. Um, but these thrips love to be in webbing. They love to navigate it. They love to be inside of it. They are the absolute opposite of claustrophobic. Okay? Tight spaces are good. Another cool thing about them is if they run out of mice to eat, they'll actually eat each other. Uh, they are cannibalistic to a certain extent, which allows them to survive when there's not as many spider mites in the feed. Now, the population from all the studies we've done is about 90% female, which is bigger because the females are larger than the males, which means they eat more. And of course, they're trying to produce eggs. So they, they eat more for that reason too, that they're, you know, they're trying to, to breed and, and have offspring. Um, all the data we have says that they can double their population every four days. And in almonds, at least in, the, in the, the southern and northern San Joaquin Valley, and based on things Emily Sims said every time she looked for them, 
they really are replacing mites as the, uh, the predatory mites as the predominant predator, predator within the system. And what we think is going on is that as growers get greener and greener and greener in their spray programs, um, you know, most growers these days aren't including the pyrethroid or an organophosphate in their system, uh, at least in, this, in the, the San Joaquin Valley where I'm, you have got the most experience. And as those OPs and pyrethroids are gone, six spotted thrips is coming back. And the six spotted thrips eat spider mites, but it also eats predatory mites. So, you know, if you've got a field that historically has had a lot of predatory mites and you simply don't see the predatory mites anymore, it's probably because you got six spotted thrips out there eating both. Um, so we'll talk about how to monitor for those. Uh, the other predator to look for is the spider mite destroyer. This is actually a ladybug, but it's about the about a quarter of the size of a traditional ladybug, like you, you know, little kids play with. Um, so the three pictures on the left, you can see the larva on the top, the pupa on the left that's stuck on the leaf, and then the adult on the bottom left uh, with a picture on the top right there to show the size proportion. Uh, these are literally spider mite destroyers. Their, their mouth parts perfectly fit onto spider mite eggs. They just they can just suck them dry, suck them dry, suck them dry, just go from egg to egg to egg. They're fabulous. Now the drawback to these guys is they oftentimes come a little bit late to the party. Um, sometimes the mites are out of control by the time they really show up and, and are effective at lowering the population. Nevertheless, they are an important predator to watch for and um, to try and conserve. You know, this is one more. This is this is one more reason you don't want to use organophosphates and pyrethroids in particular um, in your nut crops is to keep these around. So the, the concept of treatment thresholds. So th these are data over time from a bunch of untreated almond orchards. And you can see typically what mites do is there's this sort of slow build. You just, there's a few, there's still a few, there's still a few, you kind of see them, you know, half, half per leaf, one for every so many leaves. And then just something happens. And, and every PCA has had this experience, right? You go out one week and you think everything looks good. You come back the next week and you have one of these, you know, OMG moments where all of a sudden you panic. And, and you're afraid because in a week or two after that, you've got browned over leaves, webbing, and you're defoliating trees. That's the biggest nightmare panic mode for a PCA when it comes to mites. And so with spider mites, uh, it, so, so most of you have probably heard of the, the concept of economic injury levels. Okay? We do not use economic injury levels with spider mites. Okay? We're not trying to prevent economic injury per se, what we're really trying to do is treat the mites before they increase exponentially. Okay, even if they do, you know, even if the mites do cause some leaves to fall off the tree, do cause a little bit of foliation, trees are very resilient. Um, you know, especially in almonds, you're not going to see a yield loss in the current year. You're not going to see, you know, any harm the same year um, with some minor leaf loss and defoliation nor are you going to see anything the next year. Major defoliation, yes. The following year, you can get some yield losses. Um, you know, if the tree gets so defoliated that it's putting out vegetative buds instead of reproductive ones. So that's, that's really the big concern there. So, so this is kind of what happens. You can see there's this treatment threshold that all of a sudden things just take off. That's what you want to prevent. In theory, that's when you want to treat is before that happens. Well, we realize also that from the time that you make a decision to treat, that there's, we assume, maybe a week or so that it takes to order the product, get the application lined up, you know, to do all the logistics. So the two terms we're going to use is an action threshold, which is about a week before what I'm calling a treatment threshold, which is essentially the day you need to spray to prevent this exponential type of increase. So... Treatment thresholds for almonds were originally established in 1984 um, by Frank Zalem and colleague. And what they said is that if 22% of the leaves are infested and you have no biological control, okay, in that case, in, in those years, it was predatory mites, that you should treat. But secondarily, if 43.6% of the leaves were infested, that's the threshold if you have biological control present. So remember that number, 43. We're going to come back to that. And based on that, they did a sampling plan. And that's what's on this form you see on the right that you're welcome to use, um, that you, you collect 15 leaves, 
minimum of five trees, presence, absence of mites. They don't count the mites, just presence or absence. And presence of absence of predators. Walk right through the form and it'll tell you whether or not you've reached this threshold that they calculated at, at 43%. Now, in our case, you know, we look back at this and says, you know, wow, you know, 1984, that's a long, long time ago. Um, a lot has changed in the almond industry, you know, the industries in different places. Yields are, I'm guessing, in a doubled, if not more, range um, since back then. So a lot of things have changed, and the spray programs have changed. Um, so so what, what's going on nowadays? So we actually revisited this topic, and you know, 12 untreated orchards over time. We tracked the mites. We took all the data from those. We, we sort of sync, we had a way to synchronize the data, you know, since the mites don't uh, have this exponential growth on the same calendar day every year. You know, so we kind of synchronized all these curves. And what we did is we just, we put all these curves together and we decided at what point does this curve reach a 45 degree angle, okay? So when does that slow growth phase turn into that exponential phase, if you want to call it that? Now, those, those aren't technically correct terms, but I, I think you can follow me. So yeah, when, is this, when does the curve start going from sideways to up? That's a threshold, okay? That's, we say, when you need the mics to be treated. And then we backed off a week before that. And what it came down to was that the action threshold is 1.4 mites per leaf to prevent mites from being at 5.4 per leaf one week later. Because we saw that when you had 5.4 per leaf, that was the point that one week and two week and so on after that, that you had that nasty exponential growth that everyone needs to prevent. So we took those numbers, we converted those mites per leaf, and yes, we did count every mite on every leaf um, all years, insane amount of work. But when you convert that mites per leaf back to percent leaves infested, 38%. Okay, what was Frank Zalem's number? 43%, okay? As soon as we saw that, uh, like that is just one of those, dang, this is awesome. Because I'll tell you, any of you that are familiar with field research and doing this kind of trials would tell you that Frank Zalem's threshold from what 20 some odd years ago and the current threshold developed in totally different methodologies. Like I'm just telling you, research never comes out this close. So, so the fact that we were a couple under 40 and he was a couple under 40 just tells us that threshold is legit and we are extremely confident in it. So just on average, 40, okay? 40% 40 of leaves infested, you should be treating. If you do that and treat within a week of that, you'll prevent that exponential growth. Again, you know, assuming you've got good coverage and, and you know, that the mitocyte has worked. So very, very confident there. Now we want to take this the next step because, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, knowing how many, you know, if you want to know how many mites there are, count the mites. If you want to know how many mites there's going to be, count the biocontrol. And that threshold I just showed you, that 40% leaves infested, that's just the mites. Okay? That doesn't take into account the biocontrol. So what we did is we realized when we were doing trials over the years, and I, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, you know, it used to see, we used to see mites just blow up all the time. You know, in Kern County, if we didn't have a miticide early in the season, trees were defoliated in June. Like that was literally the standard every year back around 2005, 2006, and so on. And then each year we just saw less of that and less of that and less and less and less. And we just like, what the heck's going on? Um, you know, in the 2000s, we do miticide trials. You know, we'd have 40, 50, 60, 70 mites per leaf. We'd always defoliate the untreated checks, you know, three, four weeks after we sprayed. And we got to the point that we just didn't see that happening anymore. And so we started looking really, really hard, and we realized it's because of changes in biocontrol, and specifically because of the six spotted thrips. And so we did a lot of work to figure out what's the best way to look for thrips. Because you know, when we look on leaves, eh, sometimes we see them. If we collect leaves, these adults a lot of the time will fly off before you actually count it, so you miss them. When we put leaves in bags and bring them to the lab, they're just not on the leaves anymore. So we just missed them. Well, in a lot of different crops, we use sticky traps to monitor for thrips. And so we did trials. We looked at about 10 different kinds of sticky traps. And there was this one trap 
I'm not going to show you that data, but I'm just telling you all the traps, this one blew everything else away, including other yellow traps. Okay. And so the trap that we tested is now, uh, it's got a new name. Uh, it's now called Predator Trap. That's the official name, quote unquote, Predator Trap that you get from Great Lakes IPM. Uh, it's actually a product of Trace A. Uh, so you can get it directly from them also, I'm sure, if, if you've got your Trace A rep. But we put these out in the orchard. You can see uh, we just put a binder clip on it. We hook the binder clip up to a jumbo paper clip that we unwind and then just wrap the paper clip around a, a branch. Just throw this out there anywhere. There's a navel orange room trap. So typically for us, this is two per orchard. Um, you know, you don't need a whole lot of them. So two per orchard and put them out and you just pick them up a week later when you're picking up your navel orange worm or PTB or whatever else traps you have down there. And in this case, we actually count the thrips on the card. Now, as we started using these cards, we were able to do some really cool things with them. The first thing we're able to do is look at biology through the year. These cards are good. Um, like if you look at this chart here, August and September, and down in these trials, we're getting two to 800 thrips per card per week. These, these same orchards, by the way, when we do leaf sampling, we'll find like one every 10 or 20 leaves. So extremely effective. But biology-wise, we learned the first thing we learned is there's a period of thrips activity in about April or May um, into early June, up more up your way. And Emily saw this, Emily soon saw the same thing up your way. So overwintering thrips come out in April and May. They eat up those mites that are present in that early season. When the mites go away and are all eaten, the thrips kind of disappear for a couple months until the mites come back. And then when the mites come back, the thrips start coming back again. And you can see this August, September, October, there's this second period of six spotted thrips activity. So biology wise, again, spring, okay, and during May sprays is basically when the thrips are active for the first time. And then in August, you know, and then around pulse play. This right here is the predator prey chart. So the black line, this is mites. The dotted line is this is thrips. Okay, so the mites, that's um, the number of mites per leaf. And then the thrips, that's the number of thrips per card per week. This is the absolute perfect classic textbook graduate school course example of a predator prey relationship. You can see the mites start to build up. There's a little bit of a lag time, you know, of about a week and a half to two weeks. And then the thrips start showing up. The thrips increase exponentially. As they start going up, the mites start decreasing exponentially. Then eventually the thrips have eaten all the mites. The mites go down to zero. The thrips start starving. And you can see at about day 40, 45 there, the thrips start starving and they start coming back down until the natural enemy populations crash. Okay, this chart right here on the x-axis, this is the days after you hit a treatment threshold. Um, so you can see, you know, how this works. Now, the, the problem with this is sometimes the mites show up before you're at a threshold, and sometimes they show up after your threshold. Okay, so do not interpret my statement to say that you don't need a miticide. Okay, that's not the case. What I'm saying is these thrips are awesome. A lot of the time you don't need a miticide, but sometimes you do. But what ends up happening in a miticide case is the mites get going and they start, and there's that lag time for the thrips. So the mites get going for a couple of weeks. They kind of read it, reach a treatable level right as the mites get or the thrips get going. So if you use a miticide that, that knocks the mites back down and the thrips just got started, the thrips clean up the rest. Okay. And this is why one miticide oftentimes will cover in almonds a two month harvest period. Um, it's because the natural enemies are there. It's not because a miticide works for two months. We know that's not the case. Now, to the contrary, you throw a pyrethroid in your whole split spray and you kill all the beneficials, then four weeks later, you got a mite blowout. Um, and that's very common. Uh, again, that's, that's sort of self inflicted wound by not relying on biocontrol. So, um, so we have all this, you know, tons and tons and tons of data on, on thrips and mites. And so we took a couple, 
it's actually a couple thousand data points and put them together and made this chart. And on the x-axis, you can see this is the thrips to mite ratio. And then on the y-axis is the change in mite density. So on the x, the thrips to mite ratio. So on the right side, 600 thrips per trap per week for every one mite per leaf. Okay, so right is a ton of biocontrol. Left side, zero thrips per week for every mite, which means no biocontrol. And you can see what I've written here in green. You know, so as, as this thrips to mite ratio is zero, the mites increase exponentially. Okay, that's what I said basically on the first slide. We see this with the data. And then down there on the bottom, you know, as the thrips to mite ratio approaches infinity, the mites decrease exponentially. So if we take this exact chart and we put it all in log scale, this is what it looks like. And this is what we did. And we can basically draw a line through all of this to develop what we'll call a threshold. Um, in other words, how many good bugs per bad bugs do you need for the mites to stay the same or go up and go down? And we came up with that threshold. Um, uh, the technical, don't memorize this number, but you know, the technical was if there's 0.42 thrips per card per week for every one mite per leaf, it's a break even situation. Okay. Now, we know we're not asking you to count mites per leaf. Okay. And we're not asking you to do complicated math. So we simplified all of this. And um, what it comes down to, I'm going to break it down into a May spray decision threshold and a whole split decision threshold. So we know just to start off with, you don't need to treat unless you're at 40% of leaves infested. Okay. But if you look at 40% of leaves infested, convert that over to mites per leaf and use that previous threshold, what it tells you in May is that you have no need to treat if you have an average of one thrips per card per week in that April to May treatment window you know, timing. Okay, right when those thrips are coming out from their overwintering. So again, put out your cards in 1st of April. When you're thinking about doing a May spray, if you've got one thrips per card average, and if you're under 40% of leaves infested, you've got two different data points to say, don't put on a May spray for mites. Okay? Now in our studies, just so you know, and again, this is not Sacramento Valley, this is Southern and Northern San Joaquin Valley. We've had more than 20 orchards that we run experiments in over the time. And in those 20 orchards, not once have we ever seen less than one thrips per card per week during this April to May window. Never once, okay? And in many of these, um, at least a dozen of these, we've done trials with preventative miticide sprays where we, we pretty much put Agrimec on versus no Agrimec side by side. Every single time we've done those trials, where we spray Agrimec, it kills the mites. Where we don't spray Agrimec, the biocontrol kills the mites. And in the long run, every single trial we've done said that May sprays were worthless. Now, one exception to that is if you plan on killing the natural enemies, okay? If you do need to go in with a leaf-footed bug spray, big gun, pyrethroid, you know, a brigade, a warrior, or something like that uh, for leaf-footed bug early, in that case, you need to realize you are going to kill natural enemies. And sure, uh, miticide, absolutely, you need to have it in the tank just because of what you're doing to biocontrol. Um, the other exception is baby trees. You know, if you've got one-year-old or two-year-old trees, uh, the biocontrol typically is not as well established in those. And you need to be a little more, um, take a little more caution in those. So again, May sprays. May sprays 15, 10, 15 years ago, at least in the Southern Valley, were an absolute necessity. Nowadays, they are an absolute obsolete practice, again, unless you're planning to do something to kill biological control, because we are always seeing enough biocontrol to take care of early season mites. Now, whole split spray decisions. Whole split's a little more complicated, because what we see down our way in the Southern Valley is we're typically not at a treatment threshold during the first whole split spray, almost never at a treatment threshold during the first whole split spray. Our growers typically put on a second whole split spray about two weeks later. And at that point, sometimes you're at a threshold, but again, you're still typically not at a threshold. But that second opportunity for a whole split spray, that's your last chance to get in. 
Now, you know, obviously you can't treat after that. It's just logistically not possible. And so treatment thresholds are tricky because you can't, you, you can't use a treatment threshold at the time of decision-making. You have to say, are mites gonna reach a, tre a treatment threshold at some point during harvest when I won't be able to spray for it? So again, you're not gauging, am I at a threshold? You're predicting, will I ever get to one? And that's a hard decision to make. So what we did to try and help with that is we actually took all of these thousands of data points that we had and we did proportions. So we said, you know, how many thrips per card do you need in one week to say that for the remainder of the season, you will never hit a treatment threshold, okay? And essentially we, we did that, the way we did that is we looked at at what density of thrips per card will the mites go up, down, and stay the same two and three weeks after the cards are out? And the threshold we came up with is three. Okay. So remember what I said early in May? You know, one thrips per card says you don't need to treat. Perfect. Okay. We've got to be a little more conservative at whole split because, again, you're predicting whether or not you're going to get a threshold. What I can tell you is pretty definitively, if you're finding three thrips per card per week, don't worry about the mites, okay? The mites are gonna take care of, or sorry, don't, yeah, don't worry about the mites, the thrips are gonna take care of them through the rest of the season. So um, we found all this in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, Jalindra, Rajal, and Northern San Joaquin Valley, same data. Um, we, you know, when we started looking up there, we saw the same thing. Um, short, in the last you know, year or two before she resigned, Emily Sims started doing more and more work with six spotted thrips up in the Sacramento Valley. And her comment was, yeah, we're seeing them too. Um, you know, they're, they're all around. So um, you know, I can't tell you exactly how the threshold works up in your area, just because obviously we developed it down here. Um, but I've got pretty darn high confidence that you're, you're gonna have a similar type experience up there. They're just made need to be some modifications um, you know, for Sacramento Valley specific recommendations that I'm sure Emily would have done. And hopefully Emily's replacement will, will jump on and, and, and take as, uh, you know, take on as a project when that person gets hired, hopefully uh, early on this next year. And then this, the last slide here before I shift into to talk number two um, is coverage. Coverage is key. And this is sort of my walnut slide. Um, you know, every year I, I you know, I, I get walnut growers that say, David, I've, I've seen some of your data. I know you say these miticide work, but they don't work. And, you know, my response is, it's not a miticide problem. It's a coverage problem. And I don't have, a, I don't have an answer for how to get good coverage in the top of a 40-foot tree. Um, that's just a, a particular complication with walnuts for why mite management is much more difficult there. But general recommendations you'll get, you know, whether, I mean, Franz on, on the, uh, you know, is, is an expert on this much more than I am, but just generally speaking, two miles per hour is your sort of focal point of where you should be, um, plus or minus not very much as far as uh, displacing air in a tree to get good coverage. Water volume, 200 gallons per acre is standard on a tree. Um, you know, 100 gallons is fine, maybe early season agrimex small tree, but generally 200 is, is, is pretty standard, at least in our, our neck of the woods. Fan speeds, you know, enough to displace the air in the tree, but not to be blowing products through three or four rows, um, you know, if you've got small trees. And then nozzle types, you know, there, there's lots of different, mo uh, different nozzles out there. Again, I'm not really an expert on that, but, um, you know, some of these air induction nozzles are pretty darn good if you're trying to get up in the tops of the trees. So just consider that um, coverage, coverage, coverage. Uh, if, if you spend 30, 40, $50 on a miticide and you skimp on the application and coverage, you're essentially blowing money because you're not gonna be happy with the results. And chemical reps all the time get really frustrated when someone says their product failed and it's not a product issue, it's a coverage issue. So, so please, yeah, you guys are very fortunate to have Franz and the other advisors up in that area that are very good on the technology. In fact, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Franz or others advertise, but I believe there, there's a workshop coming up on air blasts and technologies and, and how to get the most out of your sprayer. So um, 
Franz, if you're listening, make a plug for that a little bit later because it very much that workshop would very much apply to anybody that's trying to manage spider mites. Okay, take home messages. I, I pounded these out and I'm I'm half a little over halfway through my talk here. So I'm gonna get to the next one. But yeah, don't no no prophylactic sprays. That's a thing of the past. Okay. If it's in the spring, use the thresholds, 40% leaves infested. Use the six spotted thrips cards, they're fabulous. And um you know, using thresholds, you can save a lot on mite sprays, which is good if you're in a tight year, um, trying to save some money. But um, it's also IPM. Uh, that's just what should be done. Um, theoretically, it also fits with everything the Almond Board's trying to do to help the industry um, be sustainable and improve it through action. So, all righty. Let me stop this one. Let me pull up my other talk. While I'm doing that, just a reminder, if you've got any questions, throw those in the Q&A. Um, I'll be, you know, after the, it, I'm on track to not have a whole lot of time to, uh, to answer questions immediately after this talk, but I will definitely stay online after these talks are over. Oops, that's not working. Yeah, so we've got David double booked here to also talk about uh, naval orange worm now. And so we'll do all the DPR questions after the end of that talk for both for both mites and naval orange worm. Yeah, let me bring, sorry, I lost my talk here. Presentations. Um, Sorry about the little technical glitch here. A nice chance for everyone to rest their brains for a take second. A little break. We had to take a straight hour of shifting straight from. Yeah, to right. I'm not giving yeah. you a break here. Where are you? Well, that's weird. For some reason, the other talk's not showing up in my window to share. So let me try this again. Yes, again. There that it comes. Was, okay. Okay. I'll go through this talk a little bit quicker. Hopefully I don't fry everybody's brains. I realized that was a lot of data. I don't normally do that, but I, you know, with, with thresholds, I, I really like to explain how a threshold was developed and how reliable it is. Not just say, here's the number. Uh, I, I do believe that helps. Uh, with some confidence. But um, okay, so naval orange worm, best management practices. So, you know, I don't need to tell everyone on this call that, uh, or, or yeah, Zoom call that, that naval orange is a problem. And you all know why. Um, so, got to deal with it. Now, from an almond standpoint, here's really, much, here's really what you've got available to you to manage. You got sanitation. Okay, what does that do? That takes out the overwintering population, prevents the first flight. Okay, you got on the top middle mating disruption. Okay, what that's going to do is that's going to um, inhibit or, or uh, diminish the ability of the moths to mate and produce offspring, and that's going to affect the first flight, uh, the second flight, the third flight, and the fourth flight if you're in an area that has one. So that's a multi-generational tactic. Um, timely harvest we'll talk about. Um, and then insecticides. And typically with insecticides and almonds, on the bottom there, you can see we're trying to take out the second generation that happens around July. Um, pistachios, if you're a pistachio grower up there in, in Sacramento Valley, it's basically the same exact thing, except the insecticide part of it is done during the third generation, typically, instead of the second generation. So going through each of these, you know, sanitation has been for you know, a couple of decades or more, the backbone of main disruption programs. And there's a lot of ways to sanitize. You know, there's, you know, shaking, of course, but pulling crews, blowing off the berms, disking, flail mowing, you know, clean out crotch, crotches. But at the same time, you know, the crows help out. Uh, if you can get a lot of water, you know, up in your area, you know, we get six inches a year if we're hopeful. Uh, last year, two inches of rain um, down where I am. But, you know, with the increased rain you get, you've got to add a benefit on your your sanitation. Uh, the goal in the literature really is two mummies per tree. And, you know, down here, the goal is a little bit lower. 
Uh, for the Sacramento Valley, you've got a little more leeway just because you've got you know a few more crows. You've got a little the weather helping you out a little bit more. Um, but two mummies is still that that threshold. And let me just show you how this works through a case study. So imagine, and, and this is all just kind of made up, but it's but the math is solid. Just imagine if you've got 200 mummies per tree and 10% of those mummies are infested. Okay, if that's the case and you shake the trees and you do sanitation and you go from 200 nuts per tree down to two per tree, okay, what's gonna happen? Let's just do the math, okay? If you were to do that, you're gonna have a 99% reduction in navel orange root, just off the bat, okay? I'll tell you, that's way more reduction in navel orange than any insecticide or multiple sprays will ever get you, okay? On top of that, what are you gonna end up with? You'll end up with 10 females per acre, okay? So you'd end up with 20 moths per acre, if you do the math, half of those you assume are female. You know, when there's 10 females per acre, you gotta realize they don't all emerge at the same time. Um, you know, the males and females just kind of coming out in that first flight over a long period of time. So it makes it hard for them to find mates just because they're kind of spread out um, in distance as well as over time. And then it's difficult to find places to lay eggs. Remember, there's only two mummies per tree. So if you've got a female that wants to lay 50 eggs, she literally has to fly to 25 different trees. She has to find every single mummy on every one of those 25 trees and lay one egg on every nut. Okay. So this assumes that she that the nut she finds isn't already eaten, that it doesn't already have an egg onto it, assumes that she doesn't double back to the same nut, you know, that another female didn't already get there. So, you know, think about the time and effort and energy it's going to take for her to get around and actually lay those eggs. And then on top of that, you've got this benefit of main disruption, if you're using it, that, you know, farther apart these moths start, the easier it is to keep them apart. So, you know, for all these reasons, you're lowering numbers, potentially inhibiting mating alone, plus main disruption if you're using it, and then you're preventing them from finding, a, you know, from finding place to lay eggs and making them spend a ton of energy in the process, which reduces the number of eggs. All of those factors combined is why sanitation is so important. It's not just one of those factors. Now, Main disruption. This is where I'm going to focus most of my time. This is really what's new. Like insecticide wise, I'll, I'll tell you, we got the same insecticides we had 10 years ago. Okay? There's nothing new. Okay? But main disruption is. And what we're trying to do here is prevent navel orange worm from being born in the first place. So we're putting out lots of pheromone and trying to keep them from getting together. And it works best when the population's low, um, but it can work at any population. It's best on larger scale than smaller scale. And in fairly contiguous orchards, that's the best because you can get a solid plume uh, of pheromone. Now, as far as products out there, you've got choices. Um, okay, so Terra has its Checkmate products. Uh, there's an organic and a conventional version. You've got Pacific Biocontrol that has its, um, uh, it's got its mist. Uh, sorry, I, I, these are coded here from another talk, but um, you know, so Terra's got its puffer system. Uh, Pacific Biocontrol's got its isomate mist system. Uh, Semios has their organic and their conventional versions. And those three products are all aerosols. They go in a cabinet and they you know, release pressurized pheromone. Uh, the fourth product is the Sidetrack Miso product from Trace. And then down here in blue is the new sprayable product from Sotera that's been out for a year or two. Uh, not going to talk a whole lot about that, per that product. It's still sort of in the um, you know, experimental, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's launched, but from a university standpoint, uh, we're still trying to figure out what we think about that particular product. But we've got lots and lots of data on the first four products that I'll be showing. So first question, does main disruption work? The answer is yes. Do all those products work? The answer is also yes. So this slide here just shows the semios, the Sotera, the Pacific Biocontrol, and the Trace aerosol and meso products, they're all the same. In fact, I, I realize this, this charter doesn't even show which one's which. It really doesn't matter. Every time we do trials, they all have similar results. So they're all good options. Uh, this trial, by the way, was on 40 acre plots, and you can see we were around 50% reduction in damage. Okay. 
The next question is how consistently does main disruption work? And you can see here, first of all, this is uh, the large bars are made, are the number of moths caught in checks and the number of moths caught where main disruption is used. Uh, this is across 12 different side-by-side -side demonstrations in the you know, 50 to 100 acres per plot range. You can see when you put it out on this larger scale, absolute, you know, excellent trap shutdown for the whole season when these products, any one of them, are put out in the spring and left out all season. So definitively season-long products. And then we come to harvest. Again, our larger scale plots. Um, this is the summary of the you know, multiple demonstrations, four different counties. Um, yeah, four different counties over two years. And you can see in both non perels and pollinizers, we're getting, in this case with the larger plots, more than 50% reduction in damage. And those error bars are, are fairly tight. So very consistent results, um, yeah, across those trials. But what about the economics? That's the third question. You know, is it affordable? Should I spend 120-ish dollars per acre on main disruption? And we crunch the numbers. We continue to do this from all of our trials. And we pretty much keep getting the same results that the break even is 1% damage. Now, what does that mean? So, you know, in hindsight, from all these trials, if you're a grower on the left side, let, let's say that you didn't use main disruption. Okay. In hindsight, if you ended up with one percent, if you ended up with less than 1% damage, if you had invested in hindsight in main disruption, you would have lost money on your investment. It wouldn't have been a bad thing to do, but you wouldn't have paid off your investment. Okay? If, you, if you just had a regular old field with 1% damage, if you had used main disruption, you would have broken even on your investment. It would have paid for itself. If you ended up with more than 1% damage average across all your varieties, you would have actually made more money, put more money in your pocket if you had invested in main disruption. So in other words, if you didn't use it and had more than 1% damage, the amount you spent on main disruption would have been less than the amount you got back. Okay, positive return on investment. But what if you did use main disruption? Similar numbers, um, just modified slightly. In that case, it's it's a half. So if you use main disruption and you ended up with less than a half a percent damage, it didn't pay for itself. If you used it and ended up with half a percent, you broke even. And if you used it and had anything more than one, anything more than a half a percent damage you should be really glad you used main disruption because you ended up making money on that investment. So those are the numbers. Um, these numbers were developed in the Southern and Northern San Joaquin Valley. And, you know, something for you to think about. Uh, main disruption, I'll tell you, you know, it's real. Um, but there's also, oh, I'll, I'll get to some other benefits in a minute. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, I am a, I'm a huge advocate. I've been I've been accused of, of selling mating disruption products, but I assure you, I don't, get, uh, I don't get a commission from those companies. And fortunately, the products from all four companies are the same effect effectiveness. So I don't, have to, uh, you know, I don't have to steer you to one over the other. I uh, just make a recommendation. Uh, it's, it's real, go talk to those four companies, shop around. There are some subtle differences between the different products uh, that I'm not gonna go into here, uh, but the salespeople will be more than willing to tell you about. Um, as far as other, uh, the future of main disruption, just to let you know, we, we continue to validate these aerosols and mesos. We're also looking at other things. Um, we've looked at some foam type products. You fly by drone. Uh, it just didn't work. The company kind of pulled it back. We have done three years of trials with sprayable product. Um, that includes uh, the one that's registered as well as a different company that has an experimental one. And just to summarize the, that particular data, um, so when we when we have put the sprayable product on four times a year or two times a year, that's the gray bars and the orange bar there. Um, the left-hand side is the third flight. The right-hand side is the fourth flight. And what you can see here are trap captures. So the blue and the orange show the trap shutdown that we get from the previous products I talked about the gray and the orange show you that those numbers in the pheromone traps are pretty similar, um, you know, maybe 40% sometimes reduced compared to the untreated checks, which says that when you're applying two to four applications of these sprayable products, 
but you're not getting traps shut down from them the way you do from the other products that are being used season long. I'm not sure why that's actually a surprise, but we've got, this is actually multiple products over three straight years summary data. And we've seen that pattern three years in a row. So sprayables, not providing trap shutdown. Um, and then yield data, um, we, we have, it's one of those yield things where there's a tiny bit reduction, but not statistically significant. We're waiting for this year's data to make a, a final, final conclusion there. So main disruption, yeah, does it work? Yes, aerosols, yes, mesos, yes, sprayable. Um, I'm just gonna say it's not shutting down traps, but let's leave it as a to be determined on whether or not it reduces um, yield damage until we get all of our data in from this year. Um, is it affordable? Yes, and I'm gonna call it the 1% rule. If you don't use it and you have 1% damage, that was your break even. Now, you know, I've asked people, if you got 1% and you break even, should you have used it? And you know, some people say, well, if you break, e break even, it's not worth the effort. But anyone that would say that, you have to consider some of these intangibles. Um, you know, what's the value of marketing? What you do is sustainable. Main disruption is sustainable. Okay? What's main disruption doing for resistance management? Okay? You can't just spray Intrepid and Alticor on every acre of almonds, pistachios, and walnuts, you know, 2 million acres a year, every year, and expect that those two AIs are going to keep working. We already know there's resistance to pyrethroids in my neck of the woods. I don't know about up in your area, but pyrethroids can't be relied on either. Um, and then, of course, even if you do break even economically, at the end of the day, you're sending half the damage to the hauler. That's less aflatoxins. Okay? If you're someone that, that owns a piece of the hauler, you know, that's added value and money you're making on the hauler side um, in addition to the, the, the grower side. And, you know, I'm just telling you, insecticides, there's nothing coming down the pipe. Resistance is only going to get worse. And as far as sanitation, it's getting more and more expensive to where it's getting more and more complicated to do it. So two of your four best management practices are slipping, which means main disruption has an important role. Okay, early timely harvest. I just wanna explain the principle on this. And let me give you a case study with nonpareils. So imagine in case one, and this is a, a Kern County case, but imagine you've got nonpareils and you harvest them by, by early August, okay? So for us, that means that you're harvesting them before the third flight starts. In that case, any larvae that escaped your insecticide spray programs gets shaken out of the tree gets removed out of the field, it gets fumigated, and all of those second generation larvae, particularly in the nonpareils at hull split and during the month of July, die before they can emerge and become a third flight. So what happens? Your third flight is much, much, much smaller. Your nonpareils can't be reinfested okay? because the flight's not there. You don't have all that pinhole damage that you get in the middle and late August. Um, and you're protecting the pollinators. Okay? You're essentially enacting a control strategy that's 99% effective at killing the second generation of naval orange worm before it can become the third flight. Okay. Now, what about if you don't do that? Let me just flip the scenario. If your non pearls are harvested in mid or late August in, in our neck of the woods, a couple weeks after the third flight started, now every one of those larvae. Um, that escaped your spray programs from hull split, they all pupate, they all emerge and become a third flight, they all fly around and reinfest your nonpareils, and then they fly around and also um, infest your pollinators. So you get a bigger third flight and you get a lot more damage. Okay? Those two scenarios, I'm just telling you, are night and day as far as the damage that you'll have. And the same philosophy occurs for later in the season. So for us, for example, if you get your Monterey's off the tree before the fourth flight versus after the fourth flight, okay? the same principle on the bottom here, I won't go into too much detail, but the same principle with, with Kermans, with the pistachio. If you get your Kermans off before your first shake in particular, before the fourth flight starts, you can get rid of all those third generation larvae before the fourth flight happens. And I know sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't have that fourth flight up in Sacramento Valley. So, um, you know, early harvest trumps all. 
Like you could, you could do a very poor job on every other management strategy, but if you get the nuts off really, really early, you can escape a disaster. Um, to the contrary, if you don't do a good job sanitizing, your spray programs aren't that good, and you decide not to use main disruption, um, even, or actually, I take it back, even if you do all of those things, but you don't harvest till really late, you can still get yourself into some big trouble. Um, this is an uh, example from pistachios, thousands and thousands and thousands of loads in 2012 and 2013. What we did here is we just looked at five different counties at degree days from January 1. And you can see the trend here. Um, these, these counties kind of all line up. Each of these is percentage of damage over time. And when you run the stats on this, what it shows in pistachios is that every 200 degree days, which is about 10 days, your damage doubles. Okay, So that's pretty scary. You know, think about that. You know, if you have if you harvest today and you have two percent damage, if you wait ten days, you'll have four. Okay, that's what these numbers show, and it's fairly consistent across counties and fairly consistent uh, across years, at least for these two years that, that the data were looked at. Um, the curves don't look quite like this in almonds, just because it's you know you got multiple varieties and all. It's a little bit different in pistachios, but the principle of early and timely harvest um, stands no matter what crop you're in. Okay, insecticides, I need to wrap up here. So insecticides, I'm just gonna say, yeah, there's nothing really new. Pulse splits your best timing. If you need to do two sprays, add in a second spray two to three weeks later. Um, navel orange sprays in April or May, they're really not very effective. The flight occurs over a long period of time. Uh, don't, don't recommend them. Um, and as far as treatment decisions, um, I'm just going to say they're complicated. Okay, you got to look at how much damage did you have in the past? How good was your sanitation? When do you think you're going to be able to harvest? What's your flight timings? Does it look early? Does it look late? What kind of captures are in your traps? You know, if it's pistachios, how many early splits do you have? Um, so I'm just going to say there's no threshold. The university can't help you out on that. It'll just say you kind of have to take all that into account. Everything needs to be sprayed once is sort of the philosophy, but not everything needs to be sprayed twice. So if you look at all these factors and everything's looking good, you know, one spray does a pretty darn good job in most orchards. Um, if any of these items here are showing red flags, you know, whether it's historic damage or big flights, or you can, you're gonna harvest late, you know, even one red flag, a second spray is gonna be uh, advisable. Um, so Intrepid and Alticor, that's the main products. Now, I'm going to put in here, avoid broad spectrum insecticides. And this comes back to the mite issue. I know there's a lot of people that try to put a warrior or a brigade or generic versions of those on to heat up their navel orange room spray. But please consider that whatever you do to try and heat up your navel orange room spray, I don't know how much it's heating it up anymore. And we know that that's the best recipe for blowing up mites. So I do not suggest pyrethroids at all in the whole split sprays uh, in almonds. I do in pistachios because the mite issue is not there. And then also watch out for spinosis. So um, delegate, just so you know, delegate does kill six spotted thrips. So, and it's not very good on navel orange room. So I don't suggest it for that. Um, and, and between intrepid and intrepid edge, intrepid edge includes delegate. So I'd suggest in the almonds sticking with Intrepid, avoiding Intrepid Edge. Now, walnuts, I know you've got husk fly. I know you've got codling moth. I, I know that pyrethroids and espinosins, um, you know, play their role for husk fly management. Um, perhaps the reason walnut growers have such bad mite problems in year, you know, a lot of years compared to the almond growers is because of those husk fly sprays. So I'm not an expert on husk fly. Um, I'll just say anything you can do for husk fly that doesn't include a pyrethroid or spinosin like delegate is going to help you with uh, conserving biocontrol. It's going to help with your spider mite programs, especially when you can't reach the tops of a tree with a spray. So um, yeah, so with that, yeah, just the last slide reminder, you know, we kind of touched on all four of these. No one of these is perfect. But if you can sanitize and do main disruption and have timely harvest and you know, do one or two insecticide sprays, all that is called integrated pest management program. 
and a well-defined and well-run program can, can and historically has been very effective on naval orndrum at keeping damage, you know, certainly under that 2%, but, you know, oftentimes down in that one and under percent, which, you know, you just have to concede the worm, no matter what you do, are going to get some of them. But if you can be in that range, hopefully you can uh, be happy with that and sleep well at night. So with that, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, the funding that came for pretty much all the work I've described came from funding from either the Almond Board or a DPR for Pest Management Alliance grant we did on main disruption. And then also, you know, a lot of these trials, um, you know, Pacific Biocontrol, Semios, Tracy, and Cetera have been great as far as cooperators helping to get us products for thousands of acres of trials that went into a lot of the data that I showed today. So with that, you, with that thank you very much and uh, appreciate being here. Thank you. So for all the attendees that want DPR credit, you should be seeing a poll right now on your screen. Um, there are four questions to cover his two talks. Um, so make sure you scroll through and answer the questions. Um, if for some reason you're having an issue responding to the poll, you could always put your answers in chat um, or send a &R program support an email just saying, hey, I can't fill out the poll, but I see the poll and here's you know, what my answers are. Um, I'll give everyone about 30 to 45 seconds additional time now to start filling it out. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, yeah, best way to monitor six sponsors, absolutely is a no brainer. It is the sticky cards. They're like 25 cents a card. You just put them out with your trap, come back a week later, you got an answer. Do you have thrips or not? And they're easy to count. So easy one. Second one, you know, pheromones for navel orange worm. So the aerosols and mesos, yes, they absolutely work. And glad that uh, for, for the five of you that say they don't work, um, text me, email me. I'd like to know if you just clicked the wrong button or if somebody wants to disagree with me or wasn't listening. Um, I'm a little concerned about those 5% that, that said false and why they came to that answer. Um, what's the threshold for mites? 40% of leaves infested, that's correct. Um, and then three six-spotted thrips captured on a sticky card during the week at hull split is the break-even point. Yes. So that's the number. Um, you've got equal chances of up, down, or stay the same. So, you know, if you're over that three, you know you're in the clear. If you're under that three, then, hey, think about it a little bit more, um, you know, because you always have to do a little bit of crystal ball work at hull split to, to decide whether or not to put a miticide in that spray. So. Thanks. Glad that everyone did very well on my very easy questions. Glad to not make it too hard for you this early in the morning. Great. Thank you again, David, for taking your time this morning to join us and give us all this great information. Um, all right. So we have one more speaker and then we're going to take a 10 minute break. So I wanted to introduce uh, Marcy Skelton from, the, is it Marcy or Marshy? Sorry, I don't actually know. Uh, from the Glen County Ag Commissioner's Office, who is going to give us an Ag Commissioner's update. Um, and then at nine o'clock, we will take a break. So I'll turn it over to Marcy. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah, it is Marcy. Uh, <laughs> you got it right. Let's see. Uh, do I go to screen share or are you pulling it up? I'm not sure. Um, if you're comfortable sharing on your own, that is probably easier so you can advance the slide. If not, I can do it for you. Okay, I think I have it in the queue. Okay, everyone should see the, the presentation. Yep. Okay. Uh, as introduced, I'm Marcy Skelton. I'm the Glen County Ag Commissioner and uh, have the next 30 minutes or so to uh, go over uh, a pesticide regulatory update. Let's see here. Okay. So I always like to, to start my presentations by just giving a little background of uh, who's in this office. I know uh, we have attendees from all over the Sac Valley, but uh, if you are uh, farming in Glen County and working with us here, uh, we have myself, we have uh, Jason, who's the assistant, Craig, who's the deputy, and then uh, kind of unique here, we also have air pollution and the CUPA program, the Certified Unified Program Agency, um, which has to do with um, the monitoring of hazardous materials. 
Uh, so you might see any of us involved um, if you call the office. Uh, and then and staff out in the field, uh, the, the ag staff, uh, we have Myrna and Yvonne, Carly, Peyton, Sam, Tom are your inspectors out in the field that um, could be coming by and um, visiting you or helping you at the counter. And then also we have Jennifer and Lisa in the office. And then um, of course, as I mentioned, we have air pollution and Koopa as well. Uh, and so we have Paku, Gerald, Allison, uh, that are field staff and um, Jennifer and Lisa uh, on the phones in the office um, as you come in. And so uh, we're all here to help. And as I go through uh, the next few slides or these slides, I uh, just wanna emphasize that, that we are here to help and every Ag Commissioner and office is the same. The intention is that um, we want to be available and we want to uh, give you all the information as um, you uh, go through your permitting process an application process so um, you get it right the first time. Uh, and so when we do come out and do inspections that um, uh, it's accurate and uh, you're on the right path. So whatever we can do to help you as you um, prepare to um, renew your permit and make your applications, um, we're here to help. A Little bit more about uh, the county here, our top 10 commodities, almonds, rice, walnuts, uh, dairy, we have um, a bit of dairy still remaining here in Glen County. Uh, apiary products, table olives, vine seed, a bit of um, seed crops, uh, the value of the cattle, um, corn and prunes. So that, that rounds out our top 10. Okay. So hold on with me just a second. I need to move something on my screen, okay. I've put on some of these presentations, but I don't think I've been a speaker on a, a webinar. So uh, figuring out all the notes here. Okay, so what I want to discuss today, uh, nothing that is brand new, nothing that um, you probably haven't heard before. And so that's good. It should all be uh, in that refresher category for you. Uh, and so that's nice that we don't have anything um, new at the moment. There always does seem to be a continual um, uh, 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 just train of things coming for you guys to, to work on. So, um, but what we have today is, is updates and, and things that you have presumably heard before. So the Paraquat update, I'm gonna talk a little bit, a reminder about pesticide use near schools, uh, apiary and um, the Beware program that has been established over the last few years. And then if we have time, go over uh, common violations that are found um, by inspectors out in the field. So maybe we can talk about them a little now and you can um, work on that before someone comes visit. Yeah. Okay, so uh, these changes around Paraquat came from the federal level. So at the US EPA, not Cal EPA or not at your local Ag Commissioner's office. Uh, and all three of those levels uh, could be asking different things um, and, and ask um, you know, permit conditions or California restrictions, but this one is um, from US EPA. So it's um, nationwide these changes did occur. So this is a little background of what went on while um, um, these steps of these, these changes. And so this first one, these are all for the registrants, so the, the chemical companies that um, register the product. Uh, and that they were asked by US EPA to revise their labels and they needed to add a few things. Uh, they needed to make it very clear that it's a highly toxic product, uh, that only certified applicators could use the product. So for here, that would be a private applicator, uh, those that have that brown card, those that have a QAC or a QAL in the category D. And uh, additionally, besides being a certified applicator, that um, it required a separate US EPA um, paraquat training that doesn't, isn't offered by our office online, you, so you don't do it here, or it's not, um, you just have to have um, records that, um, that it has been completed. So the next step that uh, was required by the registrants was to uh, submit plans for a closed mixing system um, and uh, so that needed to be required, that needed to be added to the label. And um, by November of 19, so two years ago, that um, the registrants 
or in the registration of the old product that did not comply with phase one. And so I know there are um, old product that's still out there, it's not that old, um, but and you might have some in your, your storage units or there might still be some for sale more and more uh, what you're going to be seeing um, as you purchase product is the new, uh, the new product that's labeled this way. And so that final step, phase three, was that registrants uh, had to have um, uh, wording on the label that required the closed mixing system. And again, I'll mention here that you could have product that doesn't have that language, but as with any product, not just Paraquat, you need to look at that label every single time and make sure that you are meeting that. Um, when we have inspectors out in the field, that's what we're looking at. Uh, and that's one of the major components of our inspection is that uh, the, the products or the um, instructions on the label are, are listed um, or that are being followed by the applicator. And so um, make sure that you do look at that label and know that you could have different instructions depending on the, um, uh, when that, that product was manufactured. So in summary here, the label changes that have occurred, uh, they now emphasize toxicity and there's a supplemental warning material packaging that is in the package. Uh, you have to also complete an EPA training for Paraquat users, uh, in addition with having your private applicator card with, um, uh, or a, a qualified applicator, or be a qualified um, uh, a certificate or a, um, a license holder in category D. Uh, just to kind of make this hopefully just a little clearer, uh, it's for those that handle any component. So either um, applicator um, or mixers and loaders, um, employee training is not enough. So most of the products, um, you become that, that trainer when you have that private applicator card or a QAC or a QAL, and then you can go ahead and train your employees uh, with that knowledge that you hold. And um, that, is, that is not the case in this. You must be one of those three certified um, applicator plus have that US EPA um, uh, training as well. And um, uh, there, there's no exemptions for owners, operators. It's not just employees, it's, it's everybody. So just wanna make sure that that is, is very clear. Um, so that yellow box there, it, it hits home. That's what you should see on the label. Uh, not, not to be used by uncertified persons working under the supervision of a certified applicator. So that does work in some scenarios, but not for this product. And then also that anything less than 120 gallons, uh, that needs to uh, have a close mixing system. So my next slide here, we'll see. Ooh, I think it's gonna work. A nice little video I wanna show.
Okay, so I wanted to just show an example of, of how um, that, that product uh, closed mixing system uh, is, is used for, for this um, Syngenta product and every um, manufacturer uh, will have some, I'm sure, small variation, but uh, this was a good example I thought to, to share. Okay, so on to the pesticide use near schools. This is a regulation that went into effect a few years ago. And so in summary, uh, the regulation pertains to pesticide applications made in the production of, ag, of an ag commodity within a quarter mile of a public school, so at K through 12, or licensed uh, child daycare, uh, except family uh, daycares um, do not, um, are not part of this regulation. So there's two main elements to consider uh, with this is that uh, the restrictions on when applications can happen within that quarter mile and uh, the notification that's due every April uh, to the schools. So in general, what the, the restrictions are, they apply Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m a minimum of a quarter mile distance restrictions for applications using an aircraft, an air blast sprayer, or other ground equipment that um, uses a pump that delivers spray, so an air blast sprayer, uh, sprinkler chemigation, a dust or powder, fumigants as well are included in that restriction. So it's a little less um, restrictive uh, when you're using a ground rig sprayer uh, and anything that isn't, um, Kind of has that that um, that amount of movement as those other um, application methods do. So there could be scenarios where it's a 25 foot distance. And so uh, what's required as an annual notification? So growers need to uh, submit what they believe that they will be applying to that those fields around the schools um, within the coming year. And so by April 30th every year. Uh, you need to uh, put down your best list um, that you think that you'll make making applications between July 1st and June 30th um, the, for the following year. You can submit all your information on calagpermits.org. So that's, um, you should have, I'm sure, have an account by now and um, be able to go in and electronically submit that. If that's not something you'd like to do um, electronically, we do have an option to enter it ourselves here at the office. Just submit as the list and um, we'll get that taken care of for you. Uh, sometimes there are scenarios where you need to make an amendment. Uh, something changed in your plan and you'd like to, um, to add a chemical. And I believe it's a 48-hour um, change uh, that you know, kind of heads up you need to give the schools. Uh, and um, so amendments are made the same way electronically or we can do that for you. Uh, and the schools um, have the option to go and view the list um, of what you have, um, have, have, have reported that as potential use. So that one's a short update because um, it's, it's been for a few years and, and um, I think uh, most those of you that are in with that quarter mile distance have, have made those accommodations and um, up to where you need to be. So the next change um, that I wanted to uh, go over again is as things around um, the world of the apiaries and the, the program called Beware. And so I wanted to give some summaries. Uh, again, no changes from the previous few years, uh, but wanted to, to make sure that you have all the correct information. And so I know I'm speaking to orchardist and um, but uh, we do have um, some people that uh, raise their own bees for their orchards, or obviously um, as almond producers, you're bringing in quite a bit of bees to your, um, your production sites. So everyone who does um, uh, have uh, apiaries and needs to register their bees uh, within um, 30 days of, of coming into possession of those is a registration through the County Ag Department. And um, we can do that electronically now. Um, or on paper, if that does make more sense for you. Um, but most of them are being done electronically now, and uh, most counties will be sending out updates uh, and reminders to letting you know that that needs to take place because um, the January 1st through December 31st registration. Uh, the information is pretty basic that we're collecting, name of owner, 
uh, the number of colonies that you have and where those colonies are located. Uh, it's a $10 registration and um, the information is confidential and not shared. Most of the items here in our office are um, open, open for public records request, but this is one of the few items that is not. So we do not share the information um, of the APRs. So if you have um, uh, bees that you're moving from county to county, or um, you know of APRs that are doing that, uh, if you register, let's say in Glen, you start and then you move them over to Butte um, in a month or two, uh, you do need to let them know as well within 72 hours of that movement. Uh, there's no additional fee, but the information is there. The purpose of all this is to, um, to help coordinate, um, I guess, a few things. But one major one that we're talking about today is that, um, that pesticide interaction. And what, uh, we want to be able to um, help coordinate applications and keep bees safe at the same time. So uh, that's the purpose of, of all of this. Uh, the notification, um, again, will be the name, address of the operator, um, any representatives that are listed on there, and a phone number where people can be reached. So on your bee boxes, uh, it's required that you, they're branded uh, in some way. And so the name of the owner, the person responsible, um, address and phone numbers required for each, um, each location. Um, make sure that people, you do have permission to have um, bees um, on your property. If you do ever um, have bee boxes show up and there weren't something that you uh, requested, uh, call the Ag Department. We can probably help sort that out for you. And um, make sure you have um, permission access, the basics for that. A few years ago, the Food and Ag Code was amended to allow um, agriculture um, or administrative civil penalties issued by the Ag Commissioner's Office. And so that's something that's newer. It wasn't there before. And so if we do come across um, violations, uh, those are the three categories that we could issue an administrative civil penalty for. Uh, and so Beware is a program that um, came into effect a few years ago. And it's an online collaborative um, program that helps uh, keep everybody informed. And so a few more things on, on Beware, we'll just, I wanna get to a, so as uh, growers, make sure that you hire um, uh, those, here. okay, that you hire um, are registered through Beware. And so, um, that they then you have all the right information uh, and, and they will um, be able to uh, coordinate uh, between you. So provide beekeepers with information about beware if they don't have it. And make sure you and your pesticide applicator utilize beware uh, to want, run what's called a bee check. And so let's see here, I wanted to show you the website. And so there's these three categories that are kind of themes throughout here, the beekeepers section, the pest control advisors, and then um, the growers and applicators. And so when you go to make an account, uh, those are the three um, areas that uh, you will choose to um, designate yourself as, beekeeper, PCA, and grower. And then you can you need to run these bee checks to see um, what's in your area before you make an application that could be um, uh, harmful to bees. Let's see here. Just a few more minutes. So I wanna spend um, talking about common violations that we find when we're out in the field and, uh, and as um, a good reminder. So uh, the personal protective equipment, that's probably the number one thing that we see. It goes back to looking at the label and um, making sure that uh, everything is covered. As a reminder, when you're mixing a product, often you have to have something um, additional, uh, either that, that face shield, um, a chemical resistant apron, as we saw in that first video. And so uh, make sure that um, yourself or your applicators are, are adhering to that. Uh, secondly, if you have employees, you have to have emergency medical care posted. It needs to be uh, with them. So a lot of times people uh, take this on inside of a cab, a truck or a tractor. Um, you can even have it facing out if you're able to put it on a, a window. 
uh, in a vehicle. And uh, one thing that we do want to emphasize is that uh, not just writing down the closest urgent care, um, they may or may not um, be equipped to take um, someone who has had um, an incident with pesticides. So reach out and make sure that you are um, indicating the correct um, location that will uh, take someone that has had a pesticide-related injury. Um, and when you go to, you take, if you do need to take someone um, for emergency medical care um, related to pesticides, uh, the safety data sheet is required. Um, make sure you have that with you, the EPA number, um, and the active ingredients. So taking a label with you. Um, and then be able to convey to somebody the circumstances around um, the application and then and how this um, potentially happened. And so the doctors have the full um, gamut of information when they are treating someone. Again, for employees, um, hazard communication is required. And these are the A8 and A9s. Um, make sure they're filled out. Often inspectors will find them posted, but empty. And that doesn't, um, that doesn't meet the requirement. So, Make sure that you have them posted in, um, at a central location. Break rooms are a common place um, or a, a check-in location at the beginning of the day, lockers or, or whatnot, um, and make sure that they are filled out correctly. And again, that they're at a facility, these, um, the names of the facility will take um, pesticide-related injuries. Uh, decontamination uh, sites are something else that um, uh, probably is one of the harder things to, to make sure you're getting right. Um, there's been a lot of changes in the, I've been in this line of work about 17 years now, and I feel like this one has changed most extensively. And I hate to tell you that I hear that there are changes coming as well. And so um, make following um, what needs to be done, give your ag commissioner's office a call, speak to a biologist, um, read the, the regulation and let us help you get it right. But it, um, uh, in summary, you need to have um, sufficient water, soap, um, single-use towels. Um, the water can't be at a temperature that wouldn't be um, safe to put on your skin or in your eyes. Um, and then there's a, a three gallon of water per handler um, requirement as well. And um, a change of clean coveralls uh, at the decontamination site. A lot of people make um, kind of a, a plastic tote um, box of, of some of these um, and then have them out and at certain locations or um, with um, other things that you might be moving as in shade structures or um, uh, bathroom facilities. So I think that was my last one there. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. And um, again, reach out to our office. We are here to help and, and um, want to, to give you as much as um, assistance um, as you work on your, your farming every year. So thank you very much for the invitation and on time today. Thanks very much, Marcy. You should see on your screen the poll questions from Marcy. There's only two, so hopefully we'll be able to get through this one a little bit quicker. I see 32% are filling it out. Marcy, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Again, thank you for posting your contact information. Uh, everyone can kind of jot that down in case they think of a question at a later date. Um, we're at 54% have filled out the questions, keep filling it in. And then in a second here, Marcy, I will close the poll and share the results. And then you just need to go over them, make sure that everyone is on track. Uh, Marcy, you could go over it. Ooh, everyone got that Paraquat question right. Good job. So. Uh, yeah, if you are going to make an application, you have to be a certified applicator as well as uh, complete the US EPA training. And then the pesticide use near schools uh, regulation is for um, those within a quarter mile of a public K-12 school or a licensed um, child care facility. So most, most got it. Great. Well, thank you, Marcy, for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. Um, and we're going to take a quick break now until 9.10 to rest your brain, um, refresh, and we'll meet you back here in 10 minutes for um, a quick round robin from Roger Baldwin on vertebrate management, uh, Luke Milliron on almond leaf scorch, and Franz Niederholzer on spray calibration. 
Then we've got uh, Thamus Michaelides after that on bot management and uh, Flo Trulas after that on almond wood canker management. All right, we'll see you back at 910, folks. Um, so we've got a, um, a half hour here that's going to be sort of uh, more like lightning talks, uh, quicker stuff. Uh, Roger Baldwin is going to lead us off here um, talking about vertebrate pest management. So Roger, take it away. Great, thanks. All right, everybody see that? Yep. Cool, okay. So yeah, I'm gonna be talking about <clears throat> managing pocket gophers specifically from an integrated approach. <clears throat> so I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, pocket gophers, but just to make sure that we're talking about the same thing here, uh, gophers are burrowing rodents about six to eight inches in length. Uh, so this photo at the top right gives you an idea of what one looks like. Uh, they are, of course, rarely seen above ground, though. So for us to know that they're present in an area, we have to look for some other form of sign. And the sign that we're usually looking for are their mounds, which are oftentimes horseshoe shaped in appearance with a plug towards the lower end of one side of that mound. Now, when it comes to damage, the, um, the damage can be quite extensive and quite varied and includes um, direct consumption of, of tap roots of, of plants, which can weaken and or kill those, those plants. Uh, we do see girdling of trees, uh, particularly below ground, so from soil level to uh, several inches below ground. And then, of course, their burrow systems cause all kinds of issues as well, including um, channeling of water, which leads to increased soil erosion issues. Uh, we can see weed proliferation associated with mounds. Uh, certainly there are hazards to farm equipment, farm laborers, et cetera. Uh, and, and some of the, uh, some uh, survey work that I was involved with uh, a number of years back showed that um, losses in revenue for nut and tree fruit crops are in that five to 6% to range annually when gophers are present. So certainly they, they can be a problem. When it comes to managing gophers, uh, I do certainly recommend that individuals utilize an integrated approach. Um, by utilizing multiple strategies, you're usually going to have better results than if you relied on any single one approach. There's a number of different potential tools that could be used to manage gophers, and there isn't necessarily a right or wrong combination of those tools that you can use. Uh, one example might be to initially go out with a bait application to knock down populations and then follow that up with a trapping program to target some of those remaining individuals. Um, like I said, you know, the tools that you use will vary from site to site and situation to situation, but it is important to keep in mind that mixing and matching those tools is usually gonna work a lot better than relying on just one tool continuously over time. So as far as the different management options are concerned, uh, we do have a few. Uh, here's a list of some of the different tools that we can use for managing gophers and we'll talk uh, a little bit this morning about habitat modification, bait application, burrow fumigation, and trapping. Exclusion really isn't a, a practical tool when it comes to large production ag situations for gophers, uh, certainly uh, on smaller scale scenarios, such as your backyard and whatnot, there are, there are some exclusionary tools that can be used, but not for large scale. Uh, repellents, I have a question mark because there is a repellent called Protect-T that was just registered for use in California earlier this year. It's uh, the active ingredient is methyl mercaptan and it's forced through um, subsurface drip irrigation tubing with irrigation water. And so if you're somebody who uses SDI, that's something that you could potentially look at uh, to try to help um, reduce gopher pressure in a particular area. Um, I've done some very early preliminary work that showed at least some level of repellency for it, but really there's a lot more work that needs to be done to determine if this is actually a really good uh, effective repellent or not. So stay tuned on that. Um, frightening devices are simply not effective for gophers and then shooting of course isn't a practical option for a species that lives uh, below ground. Another tool <clears throat> that sometimes is discussed when it comes to, to managing gophers is biocontrol. And with biocontrol, we're talking about the use of natural predators to help control pest populations. And when it comes to biocontrol, the uh, poster child for that is, is usually the barn owl. And the reason why is because <clears throat> we can put up barn owl boxes um, throughout an orchard, um, hopefully thereby encouraging barn owls to utilize these boxes. Barn owls tend to be relatively non-territorial, so we can artificially inflate 
Barnell densities in a given area. And Barnells do consume a large number of rodents, including gophers. Um, in fact, a, a breeding pair might consume one to 3,000 gophers in a particular year. So certainly they are very efficient predators of, of rodents, in, including gophers. Um, there's more and more research looking into the efficacy of barn owls for managing rodents. Um, a lot of this information is, is inconclusive at this point. Um, but like I said, there's, there's a lot of studies on it right now. And some of the early returns on those studies do seem to suggest at least some potential uh, reduction in, in gopher numbers uh, when you have uh, uh, relatively high barn owl density um, in a particular area. So, you know, at this point, what I would say is that it, it certainly doesn't hurt. It certainly, I think, could be a, a part of an IPM program to, to manage gophers. And, and it's something that I, I hope we'll have a better answer for um, moving forward in the future. Um, but I, you know, do keep in mind that, you know, putting up barn owl boxes in and of itself probably isn't going to be enough to um, substantially reduce gopher populations in a given area. So it really depends on what your threshold for, for gophers are in a particular site and whether or not you're, you're going to need additional tools, but probably are, you are going to need additional tools at a minimum, um, even if, if utilizing um, barn owls and barn owl boxes. Now, another tool that we sometimes uh, use to help manage gopher populations is habitat modification. With habitat modification, we're talking about altering desirability of an area for a particular pest, in this case, gophers. Several different examples that we could provide. Um, you know, I don't have time to go through all of them, but one of the tools that sometimes um, is used is burial destruction. You'll keep in mind when you have an extensive um, gopher network out there in an orchard system, even if you get rid of 100% of the gophers out there, there's always going to be adjacent populations of gophers that are going to reinvade an area. And when you have extant burrow systems and tunnels out there, that's going to allow for rapid, quick reinvasion of an orchard. Uh, so if you were able to destroy those old burrow systems, then that certainly can substantially slow down that reinvasion. We can do that through deep ripping. Of course, this isn't practical um, in, a, in an orchard, but if you're going to take an orchard out of production and then replant it, then you could go through that deep ripping process to destroy old burrow systems. And so that can be a good tool. Um, there's actual research um, on this for ground squirrels, not much for gophers. So I can't tell you exactly the depth you need to go, um, but it's probably at least a foot and maybe a foot and a half deep. Also, you know, gophers, like all animals, have preferred food resources, and in particular, they like nitrogen fixing plants, uh, plants with large fleshy tap roots, etc. So keep that in mind if you're planting cover crops, you know, planting a lot of clovers, legumes, things like that are going to increase the um, carrying capacity for gophers in a particular area and potentially increase your problem with gophers. Uh, so if you're somebody who has consistent problems with, with gophers, um, you know, maybe there are alternative um, plants that you may want to include in a cover crop. When it comes to removing gophers, there are a few different tools we can use. Trapping is, is one tool. There's a variety of different kinds of traps out there, including box type squeeze traps and pincher style traps. Um, we've certainly done a fair amount of testing over the years on some of these traps uh, to figure out which ones work best. In particular, we focused a lot on the Maccabee and the gophernator trap. And we found that the gophernator trap, which is this bottom right trap, um, was in fact the most effective. And it was most effective because we were able to capture larger gophers at a greater rate. And that's what this data slide here at the bottom left is, is showcasing. Um, so if you're somebody who has, you know, who likes to utilize trapping as a tool to manage gophers, um, I certainly would encourage um, checking out this, this gophernator trap as, as it seems to be a really good, good trap. Um, but there's a variety of different transit traps out there, and, and they all work to some extent. Most of them are, are pretty effective, but, but some I do think are probably a little bit more effective than others. We've also looked at the importance of covering trap sets. So basically, when you're, you're setting your traps, you're digging a hole and you're putting the traps down into the tunnel systems. Then you have to decide whether or not to, to cover that tunnel system up or leave it uncovered. Uh, we found that it didn't matter a whole lot either way. Um, we do have slightly higher capture efficiency in the hotter times of the year when using covered trap sets, but that slight increase in efficiency is offset by the amount of time it takes to set uh, or the, the time it takes to cover and uncover those trap sets. 
uh, to the point where we were actually catching the same number of uh, gophers per day, regardless of whether or not we were covering or uncovering them. And in cooler times of the year, we had slightly better success when uncovered, when, when utilizing uncovered trap sets. So for me personally, um, if I'm trapping over uh, large areas, I generally use uncovered trap sets, but that's really a user preference. Uh, we've looked at attractants. Are there any kind of attractants that we can use to increase capture efficiency? Uh, including peanut butter and some others, um, we didn't really see any real benefit there, so I don't I don't see the need for utilizing any kind of an attractant. And we've also looked at the importance of human scent. Do we have to exclude human scent from the traps and, and trap sets? And and this was very um, definitive. We really did not have any impact or, or see any impact of of human scent on on our ability to catch gophers. So no concerns there. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, some strategies for increasing um, the efficiency of a trapping program, but we still haven't talked about how effective trapping can be. Turns out it's highly effective. Uh, we've seen 92 to 94% uh, removal rates of gophers in a couple of different cropping systems um, when utilizing uh, trapping. So trapping is a, a very good tool for managing pocket gophers. Of course, we can use poison baits or rodenticides to manage gophers as well. Um, these are generally restricted use products for production ag, although sometimes they're not for other uses. Uh, but certainly for production ag, they're almost always uh, restricted use products. We can use first generation anticoagulants, which include difastone and chlorofastone, as well as the acute toxicants, zinc phosphide and strychnine. Of these, strychnine has consistently proven to be the most efficacious. Um, I've seen that in both lab and field trials, whereas lots of other researchers over the years have also consistently found that strychnine uh, works better than, than the others. So uh, for me personally, um, I would kind of focus more on strychnine uh, if, you can get, uh, if you can find it. As far as application methods, you know, this old funnel and spoon method works fine if you got a couple in your backyard, but for larger scale areas, you probably want to focus on um, uh, one of these all in one probe and bait dispensers, which allow you to probe directly into the tunnel system. You then crank a lever to deposit a preset amount of bait directly into that tunnel system, pull out, plug that up and, and move on to the next one. So this is a, a more rapid approach than, than the funnel and spoon method. Of course, we also have the burrow builder, which is a device pulled behind the tractor, uh, creates an artificial tunnel system below ground, and deposits bait at set intervals within that tunnel system. So this definitely is a quicker, uh, in fact, it is the quickest and easiest way to, to treat for gophers, but it's uh, certainly a little bit hit or miss. Um, soil conditions have to be right to form the tunnel properly. You have to set the proper depth. You have to constantly make sure that the, that the torpedo is, is feeding bait out and that it doesn't get plugged up. Uh, so there's a lot of potential for, for mishaps with it. So it definitely doesn't work as consistently well as some of the other tools. Uh, but in particular, if you have extensive problems with gophers over large areas, then maybe this at least could be a good first step to help knock down populations for which you could then follow up with some other tools afterwards. Uh, lastly, I want to just talk uh, about burrow fumigants. Burrow fumigants uh, utilize uh, toxic gases within burrow systems to, to um, kill the gopher. They work best when soil moisture is high, and this is a really key aspect of fumigants. You do need high soil moisture uh, for them to work well. So, you know, here that's usually starting now um, through mid spring or so. Um, whenever you've got that high soil moisture, basically, is, is when they're going to work well. Um, fumigants should never be used in or around structures. We don't know where these tunnel systems always go. Sometimes they lead up and underneath structures. And if so, then those gases can leak up into those structures and cause people, pets, or livestock to potentially uh, get sick or even and die, from, die from that exposure. So we, had, we do have to be careful. Most of the labels require you to be 100 feet away from a structure that is or potentially may be occupied. Uh, but read the label. Sometimes uh, some of them have uh, shorter restrictions on that. As far as the fumigants, we can use gas cartridges. Technically, um, gas cartridges do work well for ground squirrels. Um, however, they don't work well for gophers. They're registered for their use, which is why I mention it here, but they're not very effective for gophers. And so I really don't recommend their use there. Aluminum phosphide dose, such as phostoxin or fumatoxin or weevilside, um, these are highly effective against gophers. 90 to 100% efficacy. It's one of the absolute best tools that we have for gopher management, but it's also the most restrictive of all the tools that we have. There's lots of different situations where you cannot use them. So certainly read the label and understand if that's going to be a good situation for you. 
And then uh, lastly, we do have pressurized exhaust machines, such as the uh, PERC machine, the Cheetah Rodent Control, the Burrow RX, or the CO Jack, uh, which all inject um, exhaust, uh, which is heavy with carbon monoxide um, to asphyxiate the animal. Uh, they work moderately well for gophers, about uh, 60 to 65% efficacy for gophers. Uh, so there's some better tools, but they do allow you to treat areas pretty rapidly. And so I do think they're a, a viable tool for gopher management. As you can see, they're actually a lot more effective for ground squirrels. And so if you have problems with both ground squirrels and gophers, then maybe that's a tool you could use there. Um, so I, I think is, is most of the time I have here today, uh, I'll leave you with some, um, uh, with a web, uh, a, a list of websites, uh, that have some useful information. So if you want more information, then certainly I would encourage you to, to check out some of these resources. And Peace. I think that's my time. Thank you so much, Roger. Okay. So we have, um, launch Roger's questions right now. Sorry, can we go ahead on those? Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Roger. There's two questions. I see people are already responding. We'll go over them quickly. Again, most likely these will be on the exam, so you want to pay attention to the answers. Um, people are fast this time. We're already at 42%. Uh, another 30 seconds here. End the poll and share the results. We could go over them real quick. Sure. Um, so it looks like everybody did pretty well on the first one. Burrow fumigants cannot be used for gophers when in close proximity to buildings. That's absolutely true uh, because of the potential hazard uh, to anybody or any animals that might be uh, within those buildings. And lastly, um, use of multiple tools results in more effective management of pocket gophers than relying on any single tool. That also is true. Um, and almost everybody got that one right. So great. Great. Thank you so much for your time this morning, Roger, for joining yeah. us. All right, we're going to shift into Luke Milliron, who's going to give us a quick ALS talk. Can you hear me and can you see the slides? Yes and yes. Excellent. Good morning, scholars. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. So uh, what is wrong with my trees is a question uh, we all find ourselves uh, often asking. And sometimes that problem might be almond leaf scorch. So I'll be addressing that very briefly today. I'm Luke Milliron, farm advisor in Butte County, as well as in Glen and Tehama. So almond leaf scorch is caused by the bacterium Xylella fastidiosa. Um, you may have heard of Pierce's disease and grapevines. This is the same bacterium. Um, this may be a totally different beast, a different disease uh, in the Sac Valley where um, it's suspected that there's more of a, a subspecies called multiplex versus uh, fastidiosa in the San Joaquin Valley. But really there's just been very little work on the biology um, and ID of, of this disease in recent years, um, which, we'll, which we'll hit on at the end. It's vectored um, by sharpshooter leaf hoppers and spittle bugs, these, um, uh, you know, with the piercing sucking mouth parts that can, can vector it um, from weeds uh, uh, to the almonds. And those, those weeds could be in the orchard or they could be part of the permanent cover crop. Um, they may be adjacent to the orchard. I often find that diseases with a lot, uh, orchards with a lot of almond uh, leaf scorch disease are right next to uh, weedy alfalfa or pasture or other grasses. Um, the disease has been present in California for over 70 years, but it's really only periodically um, a widespread issue, um, which is why it hasn't been so consistently uh, studied. Um, so uh, Franz Niederholzer and myself Certainly had a lot of farm calls um, last year with Ammon leaf scorch. Uh, Franz had zero this year, and um, I had about half this year compared to to last year. So really um, varies year to year, and we don't fully understand why. So this is a, a disease problem because the bacteria that are vectored from these insects they live in the xylem and they can spread throughout the xylem and you see the symptoms 
um, when the xylem gets plugged up, when those water conducting vessels get plugged up and it results in insufficient water um, arriving to those leaf margins. And so that's why you see necrosis um, dead tissue along the margins of the, the leaves here. So you'll often uh, see this in early June to mid July, but then it can it can spread really quickly. So this is September, um, and by then the leaves are pretty uh, pretty fried. In terms of other notes on identification, it's really important to distinguish this from other things that could be causing uh, chlorosis and necrosis of our leaves. Um, so. Uh, Flo Trius has this, uh, this great photo example that he tweeted out um, a few years ago with salt burn um, showing not much of a, a yellow margin uh, versus a significant yellow margin with Ammon leaf scorch. Um, but I remember uh, when Flo tweeted that out, that David Dahl uh, chimed right back and said, well, it's not always that clear. Um, salt burn can have um, that yellow margin. So uh, these, uh, it can be really tricky to, to diagnose uh, out in the field with, with these symptoms alone. Um, but the disease can spread over time. It may start with just one scaffold and a few leaves, uh, but it can spread throughout the tree. It often doesn't spread tree to tree, but it can be vectored from the tree back to grasses, back to another tree. So it often has a very scattershot pattern throughout the orchard of a, here, a tree here and then a tree 15 trees away um, versus salt would often be a more concentrated area um, that may uh, be tied to um, you know, weaker ground or, or some soil characteristics. So you'd expect uh, salt damaged trees to be um, probably next to each other. In terms of some differences with, uh, with trees we have out there, we don't have much Nimagard in um, the Sacramento Valley, but uh, it is resistant. So the variety on top of Nimagard roots can get infected, but then the infection will typically just die out because uh, the Nimagard roots are resistant. Um, we don't really know anything about the Crimsk 86 susceptibility, which is you know, the dominant rootstock we have now, um, but that's being investigated. And I suspect that it is, um, that it is susceptible. Um, in terms of um, you know, some older reporting noting that Peerless, Sonora, Winters, Livingston, and Wood Colony um, are all uh, you know, on the, the more susceptible continuum of varieties, and I've certainly seen a lot of it on Wood Colony. And last year in the Sac Valley, I certainly saw a lot of it in Monterey. Nonpareil is definitely susceptible, um, while it's rare in Carmel and Butte. In terms of, you know, what, if you suspect ALS, the first step is test for salts, you know, we're still in a drought, um, and uh, you know I think that especially during a drought, chloride uh, should be part of your leaf analysis anyway. So you got to rule out that it's it's not chloride first. If your sodium and chloride levels are normal, uh, you can consider contacting your your farm advisor. Uh, sometimes we can take samples and and submit them uh, to a USDA pathologist for you. Um, but we will not take a sample uh, if you haven't already ruled out chloride. Um, you can also, uh, for example, if, if a farm advisor can't, can't help you out with sampling, you could uh, go to a, an ag lab, um, an ag um, pathology lab, and uh, those the samples are expensive though. And whether, uh, you know, we, we, you go through the farm advisor or you go through a private lab, you know, it's like a COVID test. They are not 100% accurate by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to you have to take these results with a grain of salt. I've I still have orchards that I feel absolutely have ALS, um, but you know, but they continue to test negative, or they test negative the the first time, um, but I get a positive test with subsequent testing. Management or really lack thereof. There really isn't much in the toolbox here. 
Um, there's no chemical, nutritional, insecticide treatments for the vectors. Really, none of that has been shown to be efficacious. Um, so we're, you know, in the in the mode of flagging any affected trees take a photo or video and document exactly what that tree looked like on that date um, and then come back the next year has it spread is this becoming more of an issue is this tree declining um, track it out that way the historic recommendations have been you can consider scaffold removal um, but you have to remove the scaffold five feet plus from any symptomatic leaves just to have a chance that the disease won't continue spreading. So not guaranteed uh, that, the, that you won't completely cut out the, the bacterium. Um, the classic recommendation is to remove trees in orchards under 10 years old, uh, 16 to 20 years old, probably just live with it. And then the 10 to 16 years old uh, are the difficult call um, in terms of living with it or, or removing. But personally, I'm really starting to question these recommendations. They seem too severe to me. Um, and some of the, the reasons I think that they might be too severe is, uh, what if the disease spread is, is really stalled out or very slow? And Franz Niederholzer and I have been observing a tree at the Nickel Soil Lab since 2015 with ALS symptoms, and it really hasn't gotten any worse than it was in 2015. Um, versus in at the, the Chico State Ammon Variety Trial, Ammon leaf scorches just proliferated throughout the entire trial on all, all these, you know, almost all the, the varieties. Um, so if it's so ubiquitous in the orchard, of course, you're not going to remove, uh, remove the trees, you're, you're going to live with it. And that's an incredibly productive orchard still, still 3000 pound uh, non -parels. Um and then, of course, what if the, the, you go through uh, this culling and you remove an infected tree, you put in a replant and it gets infected uh, like this photo. So that is an insult to injury uh, you certainly don't want. But, um, you know, really, we don't have much in terms of management and we don't really even understand the biology of uh, of this disease in the Sac Valley, where it's necessary, what's vectoring it, what weeds it's in, what the disease progression looks like. Um, but, uh, you know, recent uh, proposals to CDFA and the Ammon board got turned down. And I think part of that is that um, it's not perceived as a high priority. So please, please, please fill out the survey uh, that Kelly will send you at the end of the meeting today. Because um, one of the questions is the prevalence uh, that you're seeing this. Um, because if you are seeing this and you think uh, it's something we should be working on, uh, we need to know that so that we can go to the funding agencies and get money to research it. So, um, of course, um, more information always at sacvalleyorchards.com. We have an article on Ammon Leaf Scorch. And you should all be listening uh, to my podcast with Phoebe Gordon and Clarissa Reyes called Growing the Valley, which you can listen to wherever you listen to podcasts. All right. Great. Thanks Thank so much, folks. Luke. All right, we're gonna shift um, right into Franz, who's gonna be talking with us about um, <clears throat> spray calibration. Okay, thanks very much, Kat. Um, can you hear me and see my screen? I can hear you, but it's showing all your slides. Oh, all right, let's see. You just need to put it into presentation mode, I think. All right, I just went there. Um, okay. If you go to, the, go to the top where it says display settings, um, and then on the, when you, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. If you're seeing, yeah, right there, and then swap presenter view and slideshow. Awesome, thank you. Beautiful. Okay, um, we were just talking about air blast spraying very briefly this morning, um, just to remind everybody, and David did a great job of putting that in front of the group uh, on his talk, particularly about mites, but about navel orange room coverage as well. With the products available today, and probably you know uh, from ongoing, excellent coverage is required to get good protection. That's always been the case with fungicides 
and particularly the case of some of the materials that we have um, for uh, worm control, altacores, intrepids, things of that nature. So um, I'm going to, I have more slides that I'm going to cover, so pardon me that we're going to blow through some of these. Um, just it, at this time of the year, it's a good time to stop and clean up your sprayer and get ready for the new season, or, or at least put it in your calendar to do that before bloom. As David, again, appreciate his pointing these out, there's several programs that can support what you're hearing today. There's going to be an, an in-orchard sprayer tune-up on January 12th in Calusa County. Um, details to follow. There is a, uh, a spray safe program in the morning of January 18th, a bunch of hours, great talks, and then a, a Zoom program led by Dr. Peter Larby uh, will be May 16th to 18th. Uh, the, day, the first day will be especially valuable for growers and PCAs as is a review of current practices and new technologies. The next days will be interesting, but, uh, but the, uh, the first one in particular. Uh, just a plug for maintaining your sprayers. Make sure everybody, the operators and everyone in the crew knows where the filters are, uh, pay attention to them. Uh, and, uh, and, and general maintenance is a great time of the year to go over the sprayers. Three take home points in the air blast spraying, match your sprayer ground speed, speed to the tree. You can drive faster in the spring prior to, to uh, canopy fill uh, and get the job done. Once you get the canopy fill and the nuts start to weigh and you know, get, get some weight and, and come down, you have to slow down to get effective coverage. Adjust your nozzles, spray, you know, target the, the, the part of the tree that's got uh, the crop and uh, also consider gravity. So aim high, shut off nozzles that don't uh, target tissue and calibrate at least twice a year. Uh, well, calibrate at least once a year and twice a year will give you your most efficient application. Uh, winter bloom, you're looking at faster ground speeds, generally speaking, and lower uh, spray volume. So you're going to get an efficient application with, with good results. Whereas once you get into spring and, and um, into, into summer, you're going to have to slow down and up your volume to get this, the job done. So you'll be less efficient, but you will be effective. If you don't do that, you'll be ineffective. And that's a waste of time. Spraying is expensive. Pay attention to spraying. That completes the circle of, uh, of effective pest management when, when those sprays are needed. Uh, gallons per acre, which you need to know in order to max, mix the right amount of chemicals and get the, the job done is gallons per minute over acres per minute. You need uniform coverage. The if you don't cover the tops, you're not protecting the tops. And as David pointed out, you know, if you're uh, unless if you've got materials out there that impact your beneficials or you don't have beneficial present as soon as your miticide wears off, anything you didn't cover in the tops of the trees is going to move down into the rest of the tree. Airflow get, uh, get the material through the tree. Spray flow gets the nozzle, gets the, the product the right coverage at the right part of the tree, and then just check, check it. Measure your ground speed in the field. Measure your spray width. And ground speed and width is going to give you your acres per minute. Get use your use the uh, catalogs to determine how many nozzles and what nozzles where in the canopy to get the gallons per minute you want. Make sure you've got more volume out of the top half of the sprayers. The old saw old rule was two thirds of the volume of the top half of the nozzles that are open. Gravity is going to help you in that. You're not going to undercover the lower stuff. In my experience, you almost always overcover low in the canopy because you're going to you're getting some spray directly di directed there through the nozzles, and you're going to get a bunch of raining out. That's uh, coverage you get at eight, twelve, and fifteen. A week you can get at, at those heights with eighty percent of the spray coming out of the top half of the nozzles at two parts at, at two miles an hour at hull split. Aim high to get the best results. Again, you're going to have different spray volumes at different times of the year because your target's vastly different, the area of your target. And we we'll go through this quickly. Just check your delivery at the end. Confirm your flow rate. Fill the sprayer all the way full. Run it at your operating pressure for a certain amount of time. Turn it off. Fill it back in with your um, with a hose with a, a flow meter on it. That's going to give you gallons and calculate gallons per minute. You know you're putting out. You use that with your ground speed, and you can get your acres per your gallon, pardon me, your gallons per acre correct. 
check your coverage. This is an, a helpful step. Um, make sure you're getting done what you think. Water sensitive paper is the way to go because it's the one thing that we have some experience with and can tell you, uh, you know, the certain amount of coverage is going to give you effective control or should give you effective control. And with the surround or just eyeballing it, it's, it's, you're on your own basically. Um, finally, spraying above the treetops is, you know, is wasted spray. It's not getting through the canopy. It might rain out the tops, and, and but you're not getting coverage down within the canopy where you want it to get done, and it's bad karma. Um, everybody, these are pictures all taken from public from roads, and that's um, again, we need to maintain the ability to spray, and th this kind of stuff is is, a, is bad karma. Uh, also, just a plug for every other row spraying with a protectant pesticide, particularly fungicides. Is every other row protection. These are data from Jim Adaskavich. You know, once you get the 40% bloom on the near side of your sprayer, you get great control. On the back side of the sprayer, where you're spraying every other row, you're not getting control and you're getting resistance risk for resistance development. Um, you can get away at, at, at pink bud and almonds with every other row, but once you get to even 50% bloom, uh, that, that window's closed. Just a reminder on these dates. January 12th for the uh, sprayer tune-up, the 18th for the spray safe, and uh, May 16th through the 18th, <clears throat> pardon me, for the, the Zoom program. It's your speed, your speed right, target the spray at your trees, aim high, and then calibrate. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Franz. So we just had the, the questions from Roger's uh, part of this section. We don't have questions for Franz and Luke. So we're gonna shift into Thamus's talk now on uh, managing bot cankers. Good morning, Thamus. Good morning. Is it the button now? Yep, Perfect. it's great. You're good. Okay, um, sorry for this. Uh, trouble here. Um, sometimes I have trouble with the microphone, sometimes with this uh, presentation. So today I'm going to present differences in management of Botrysphere canker and blight of walnut from the management of uh, band canker of almonds. So before I go to into the presentation, I would like to explain to, to present two definitions. What is a blight? Blight is the result of infections that occur through natural openings like uh, landy cells or stomates. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, the result of these infections that uh, uh, kill uh, current growth uh, 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 plant uh, organs like uh, flowers, uh, fruit, uh, leaves, and even shoots. The definition for the canker is uh, uh, the canker is the result of uh, uh, infections through uh, uh, artificial wounds or uh, through uh, damage of tissues, so, uh, like uh, a damage from sunburn or freeze or uh, herbicide damage, for instance. And this involves uh, usually tissues that are uh, in older wood. And uh, you can see here an example of on the left, uh, cytospora canker that starts on a prune that started from a grafting union there, from the grafting wound. And to the right, you will see <coughs> the band canker, the actual disease of that we're going to discuss uh, that uh, started from uh, growth uh, wounds, growth uh, uh, cracks uh, that actually are wounds. So um, the first disease, which is sphere canker and blight, includes both types of symptoms, cankers and blights. And the uh, band canker bulbo includes only canker. Okay. So I will go into the botrysphere of uh, walnut. And uh, you can see here the blighted fruit that uh, this is really what uh, uh, causes uh, uh, damage uh, and losses in, in the field because uh, 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 fruit can be infected. And uh, in cases where we have severe disease, uh, you can see uh, that uh, we have a lot of infected uh, blighted fruit uh, in this light. The other type of uh, 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 symptom of this disease, which is also major, 
is the cankers in, in shoots, uh, as you can see here, and also cankers uh, that invade the shoots uh, from uh, blighted uh, spurs, you can see here. In, in addition, important uh, uh, canker is the canker that initiates from the pruning wounds and uh, the walnut uh, uh, pruning wounds are very susceptible to infection. This uh, disease is widespread and you can see from this map, you can find it throughout the counties where walnuts are grown in and it is caused by uh, 10 different species in the Butchospheriaceae family and similar uh, type of symptoms uh, can be caused by two formopsis, at least two formopsis species that we identify and those belong into, into the family Diapothesi. You can see from the map also the number six in a physical Mediterranean can be found. Number six can be found in most of the counties. And you can see 11 and 12, which is the formopsis so occurs in Stanislaus, Stanislaus and San Joaquin Valley, which is not listed here. So the disease is uh, very widespread and uh, um, the Botryosphereaceae fungi are very diverse fungi. We can have this uh, general here as, a, as an example, the Botryosphere neophysicocum, the Lassio diploidea, the Neoscitalidi dimitiatum, which is actually the new name for the uh, uh, old name that uh, caused the uh, branch wilt of walnut, the uh, 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 Hendersonula toruloidea. So, and you can see also that these fungi uh, produce diverse type of spores uh, from uh, uh, spores with no color, one cell, spores uh, which are black or brown, and minute uh, spores uh, of the Neoscitalidum, which actually they're not spores, but uh, spore, uh, uh, the mycelia of this fungus uh, break down and become this uh, uh, type of, uh, uh, we call them ath atherospores, and these become airborne, they spread by air. So these uh, spores are produced, uh, uh, all these fungi, the Botryosphereaceae produce pycnidia. In this, uh, uh, you can see here, this uh, uh, section, uh, pycnidia in a canker shoot, all these cankers will be covered with pycnidia. And when they, uh, they are in a gel, uh, it's jelly type, uh, and when they get wet, they ooze out and they become uh, water splashed. But also in the walnuts, we have the perfect stage, the sexual stage of this fun, some of these fungi, which is uh, the pseudothesia, very similar to pycnidia, uh, a little smaller, but these produce these little sacs with eight uh, spores, the ascospores, that uh, uh, become airborne. So the fun, these fungi in walnuts uh, can spread uh, both ways with water splashed uh, spores and also can spread by air, air, airborne uh, spores. Now, what happens when these spores are in the, um, in the orchard, uh, flying and uh, splashing? Um, they cause infections that we do not uh, develop any symptoms, and we call these the latent infections of uh, uh, walnut fruit. They infect the walnut fruit, they don't infect the uh, leaves in walnuts. So this latent infection by definition involve a parasitic relationship of the host and the pathogen that will induce microscopic symptoms later, okay, not uh, later in the season as the tissues will mature and uh, the infection is successful early in the season. And this uh, actually is the basis why we apply fungicides when we don't see symptoms at the time when the fruit looks very, very clean. And this is to protect all these tissues from these latent infections. As the uh, holes mature, these uh, latent infections will decay, will inf uh, they will be triggered and they will decay the holes and the infections in walnuts from the peduncle, from the holes will move it through the peduncles into the spur and they will blight the spur. The blighting of the spurs will kill the buds and that's another major loss because the buds are the fruiting structures for the next year's crop. And also they will blight the, the leaves. Now, how do we know we have this latent infections? We did this artificial inoculation, serial inoculation started from May until September. And you can see here, uh, even with inoculations we, uh, in May, we get about 60% 
blighted fruit at the end of the season. We also get uh, infection of invasion of the kennels by the mycelia of the fungus, which results uh, to uh, a walnut mold. And this is uh, something that we see in the field that some of the, of the nuts that have walnut mold is the butyrosphere and even phomopsis. So this indicates that we have infections that occur very early in the season. And that's where the design for the application of the fungicides. We have, for instance, the calendar sprays are done in mid-May, mid-June, mid-July. And this is done to protect those green fruit from the latent infections. The Cankers that develop from pruning woods are very, very significant in walnuts because the walnut wood is very soft. It has the uh, pitha channel here that helps for these infections. And we showed in experiments, these uh, pruning wounds in walnut are very susceptible for a long time, at least uh, for four months, uh, we were able to produce uh, cankers up to eight uh, centimeters here. Uh, that uh, almost uh, th three, uh, four, three, four inches uh, cankers that really uh, it's uh, an indication that the, the, uh, the, the pruning wounds can be uh, remain susceptible for a long time. The other thing that we have in walnuts is the walnut scale that predisposes the shoots to infection by Botrysphyria. And uh, we noticed that a lot of these uh, shoots develop Botrysphyria cankers. And we show this with artificial inoculations with no wounding when we inoculated shoots with scale, walnut scale, versus shoots with no scale. With this uh, three butyrosphere AC pathogen, we we're able to get 60 to 70% more shoots uh, uh, with scale were infected uh, by this fungi and develop cankers than the shoots with no scale. How do we manage this disease? We have, uh, of course, uh, accumulation of uh, pycnidia on the tree canopy, and that uh, leads us to develop uh, control uh, approaches. And this is one thing that we have to, uh, the growers have to do is to avoid sprinkler irrigation that wets the canopy, because that creates conditions that really favor the infections, the latent infections to develop even sooner. Uh, and when I say sooner, that's August, September. Uh, also to prune the dead branches or shoots uh, because of these are where the, the noclum is located. And uh, uh, when uh, they try to um, do the, uh, if they leave the, the, the prunes in the orchard, at least they can uh, chip them because that can reduce uh, by 50, 60% the, the, the survival of in the chips of the, pr of the prunes. Chemical control, the chemical control really takes care of the blight phase of this uh, disease. We have very effective fungicides for the control of uh, this disease. But let me show this example here, where this we have an, an orchard to uh, irrigate with, uh, with a, a, a set of uh, sprinklers that have a very high angle of trajectory angle and they, they wet the canopy. And in the middle of September, we see the active uh, disease developing blighted fruit and blighted leaves. We recommend these growers to use uh, sprinklers that have low trajectory angle, so the, the, um, the, traje the canopy of the trees is not wetted. The other thing, the cankers uh, that develop in the, the blighted spurs, uh, spur, spurs and the shoots that uh, are colonized with Botrysphyria eventually will colonize the entire lower branches. And these lower branches, because they are weak and they're covered with scale, they become very susceptible and be covered with pycnidia of this fungi. So it is essential to do sanitation and remove all these dead branches because in that way you can reduce a lot of inoculum. This is a trial from 2021 with fungicide applications. And you can see here by doing the sprays, we can reduce the blighted fruit. You can see there is a reduction here. We don't have the statistics yet, but still uh, you can see some of this uh, new chemical here, here. The BSF is uh, the top one. In previous tests, uh, Marybone was the top. And also this type of reduction of blighted fruit leads to reduction of blighted spurs. And here is an older uh, trial 
uh, we had about 10% blight exposed. So you can see the fungicides are really effective in reducing the incidence of blight dispersed as well. And these uh, represent uh, sprays that are done three sprays uh, in mid May, uh, mid June, and mid July. Uh, we, uh, Jim Adaskovic from UC Riverside and I, we revised these uh, fungicide tables. This is now is posted in the at UC uh, Riverside and uh, we'll post it here in our center, but still is under review. Uh, I don't think the uh, UC IPM site has it uh, yet, but uh, this uh, represents all the updates we have in the tables. And you can see we have a number of effective fungicides with uh, four pluses, which show the good, uh, excellent efficacy against the Botryosphere blight. And the fungicides that are effective, they fall in, in these categories. Mainly we have uh, the strobilins in FRAC 11, the uh, SDHIs uh, in, in FRAC 7, and combinations of uh, uh, these two, as well as combination of triazoles and uh, strobilins and uh, carboxamides. The growers have three uh, uh, choices regarding the timing. We, uh, if a grower decides to apply one spray, the best timing for the spray will be late June, early July. The second and um, uh, second, uh, second option is the calendar sprays mid-May, mid-June, mid-July. And this is something that pest control advisors prefer and also the growers. The third uh, uh, option is to the use of the, the leaf wetness model which is based mainly on rain events and temperature that lead to infection events by the fungus. This model was developed, the leaf wetness model was developed based on 15 different orchards, pistachio orchards, and it is used now for walnuts. It works well. It depends, uh, uh, mainly takes account into account the temperature and the duration of leaf wetness during the rain. There are uh, infection events uh, to have an infection event, you at least uh, need uh, uh, one fourth of an inch of rain and at least uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, we, the general rule is we spray if a point uh, based on the conditions uh, of falls into this high and medium risk areas, we uh, decide uh, the spray is needed. And uh, if it is, it, uh, if the point falls into the low risk, uh, uh, spray is not needed. But also you have to consider, we don't spray in every time we have a rain. We also have to consider the residue, the duration of the radius of the uh, previous uh, spray. Now I will move, I will move close to the, uh, uh, to, uh, soon to the uh, next disease, which is the band canker. Uh, as the name indicates, it is uh, uh, a canker that develops like a band. Uh, here is with one single band, and here is a tree with two bands. Uh, this is, was from the previous year, and you can see here that this uh, this is not active. And then there is a second band that develops on these uh, trees. Also, the band canker can be developed on the lower scaffolds, as you can see here. You can find also infections by Botrysphere in the crotch of the trees, particularly if there is a kind of a wound from cracking due to winds and things like that. So a severely infected trees, uh, and these are probably about five, six years old. You can see um, trees that uh, have canopy that is yellow uh, and very thin in comparison with the healthy tree here. And uh, these uh, CV infections will lead, depending where the canker uh, develops and uh, how severe it is, it will have a part uh, of the tree uh, dead, a scaffold or two scaffolds, or the entire tree. And to distinguish this from uh, Phytophthora or crown rod um, is uh, uh, this, uh, the suckers. The disease does not invade the, the rootstock. And you'll see uh, in dead trees, a lot of suckers that will develop and that's uh, very characteristic. But what you see also can infect uh, pruning wounds in the young trees as the grower tries to develop the uh, major scaffolds. And in orchards where we have severe uh, inoculum, a lot of inoculum will have infections 
of the pruning wounds. Now, I said this is not a blight, but in my 30 plus years career, this is the only uh, time when I found blighted fruit by Botrysphere causing this unique canker. So I, I do not consider the band canker as also as a, a blight disease. So that's why we do not spray almonds for uh, the canopy of the trees for Botrysphere control. The causes of the band canker are eight different species of Botrysphere and these species are common, uh, can be found uh, causing the uh, walnut canker and blight. And also a Fomoxis species that can occur in both. And you can see that uh, we have uh, a continuum of uh, infections from one crop to the other and spread of inoculum from uh, um, the almond to walnuts and vice versa. Now, the almonds in almonds also, we have the Pycnidia, this fungi will produce Pycnidia and the pycnidia in almonds will be produced mainly on the trunks and also in the cankers in the scaffolds. We found out by inoculating for two years uh, potted trees that these infections uh, uh, of Bogosphere develop mainly in, in the spring uh, it, to a higher extent. For instance, the first year, March through April, where the highest, uh, uh, the longest uh, cankers develop the second year uh, through April to, um, to, to May. So uh, it seems that during that time, this canker is developing. In fact, uh, that's the time when we see the first uh, uh, symptoms uh, that uh, uh, show in the orchards. How to manage this disease? We try several things. And the general rule here is once you have the cankers, you cannot, uh, um, you cannot uh, cure them. In other words, um, we uh, try to uh, apply uh, fungicides uh, as a pest paste but after scraping the counter or by injecting fungicides and we were not successful to uh, uh, prevent, uh, to stop these infections. The only thing that we were able to do in a trial up in Butte County with the Emeritus uh, now of uh, Joe Connell, uh, we install in an orchard uh, these uh, splitters in the sprinklers, and uh, we uh, the, the splitters were installed in July first uh, uh, on July first, and uh, we did not see any effect by October. But the following year, we saw an effect. Uh, this uh, type of uh, management reduced the infections by fifty percent. So that was the only uh, uh, successful method. Uh, and the years when we studied this disease, we saw that uh, infections uh, really are associated with uh, the presence of inoculum. Here we have an example of a young orchard, and uh, here we have the canal with the riparian trees. And these trees are all hosts of Botryosphere. And when we examine the disease, we see most of the disease close to the uh, the canal and close to the riparian areas where the source of inoculum was, and while on the other side of the orchards there was no disease. That's uh, we saw the same pattern when we uh, had uh, almonds next to uh, severely infected walnuts. So, in addition to this type of spread, now we see a, a different type of spread, a very uniform. Uh, uh, a development of the disease, a pattern that is throughout the orchard very uh, normal, uh, very uh, uniform. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, in very young orchards. This is second leaf orchard and this is a third leaf orchard in Stanislaus County and in Butte County. So we did uh, hypothesize perhaps these trees were infected uniformly as soon as they were planted. Or the second hypothesis, the trees were delivered to the orchard bearing latent infections, not shown in any symptoms, but they had these latent infections in the young tissues. So we rejected the first uh, hypothesis because we couldn't find inoculum throughout or around the orchard, obvious inoculum that can cause infections uh, right away. And we then focus on the second hypothesis to see if we're dealing with latent infections in these young trees uh, when they, uh, they were delivered into the uh, to the grower. We needed then to develop a method to detect these latent infections. 
And this was developed here by uh, a molecular method that really quantifies the qPCR, quantifies the DNA of these fungi in uh, very young tissues uh, using specific primers that will bind uh, um, with the DNA of uh, certain canker fungi. So we uh, examine newly emerged shoots and also one year shoots or no disease symptoms at all, very healthy. And we found for, by doing that in three orchards, first leaf, second leaf, and third leaf, we found three major pathogens, the Bochosphere, the Thelia, Lassio diploria, and Ephusicocum. And this was the first evidence that we do have latent infections in these young tissues. We also got in, uh, trees from nurseries and we examined their shoots with no symptoms of disease. And we found, uh, uh, and regardless of the variety, all these varieties have, um, we examined the head uh, Lassio diplodia, which is very aggressive species. And we found this in higher levels. Versus uh, diplodia, also in the same family, but uh, this is not very aggressive in lower, uh, lower levels. And Ophysicocum was found in intermediate low levels, as well as some cytospora. We know cytospora can cause uh, cankers in almonds, so not so much as in prunes, but yeah, it was still, it, it is a pathogen. So now we're focusing mainly uh, uh, into the nurses to see if uh, um, we can clean these trees uh, from the latent infections and uh, uh, deliver to the growers uh, uh, clean trees. We wanted to see then, since we have latent infections and this these trees were planted in the orchard, if we can uh, really uh, uh, protect them uh, from the infections actually to develop to uh, disease symptoms. And in this orchard, we apply uh, toxin in a second leaf orchard uh, with no symptoms at all of band canker. And uh, this was applied in, in March of 20. 19, the chemicals, and we recorded this, this eight months later. Uh, uh, we recorded the trees, and we found that about 50 to 60 percent of the treated trees uh, developed symptoms of canker, sapping and uh, cankers. In comparison, the treated trees with toxin or toxin and rally, they had very low levels of uh, um, uh, symptoms of band canker. We went back uh, uh, 16 months later in May 2020, and we found out that we had a little bit of increase of the band canker symptoms in the untreated, and uh, a lot more increase in the treated, as you can see here, which indicated to us that uh, perhaps a second uh, application in the following year, in the spring, in early spring, was uh, necessary. But uh, this is not true, because when we went this year, uh, 33 months uh, after the initial application, we found out that this, those cankers that uh, uh, developed uh, initially in the treated trees with toxin and rally or toxin, uh, they, they, they just died. The trees are surviving. And the only trees that have severe symptoms now uh, to some extent are the trees in the untreated control. So in, in a way, the second treatment perhaps was not necessary, it was not needed. This is something very interesting to follow up and to uh, see if we can replicate this in the uh, second orchard. So with this, uh, I want to summarize the cultural management in those two diseases, the walnut bot, uh, canker and blight. Uh, this uh, does not kill the tree. In contrast, the band canker can kill the trees. Uh, especially young trees. Remove, uh, uh, so for the control, the sanitation is very important here because uh, there is an accumulation of inoculum on the, on the uh, walnuts and to, um, uh, it's important to remove the kill branches and shoots. And also for the uh, almonds to remove the kill trees and stems because the pycnidia of this fungi uh, develop on the trunks and also on the stems of the trees, do not leave the stumps in the orchard. Apply uh, a spray, uh, apply spring and early uh, summer fungicide sprays in the canopy, and this takes care of the blight phase of the disease, because we do not have this in, in almonds, but in almonds we can apply the toxin um, in the first, second or third uh, uh, leaf orchards, 
before the appearance of the symptoms and that uh, will uh, protect the trees from developing band canker symptoms. Avoid wet in the tree canopy. That's very important uh, uh, for walnuts because it creates uh, uh, favorable conditions for infection and avoid wetting the trunk of the young almond trees because also that will create conditions for development uh, of the latent infections that are in the young trees to express symptoms. Control the walnut scale. We saw that the walnut scale is uh, detrimental for the Bogiosphere, but uh, uh, for the band canker in almonds, uh, uh, I don't think there is any relationship. Uh, band canker is independent of the scale. Protection of the pruning wounds uh, in walnuts will be very, very difficult. And this is because they are uh, so susceptible to infection for so long time. Protecting pruning wounds in almonds is, is possible by applying the toxin uh, to the label rates. And of course, for the band canker, obta obtaining clean trees uh, from nurseries is important. Now, if we consider latent infections, uh, uh, on the fruit of walnuts and also latent infections on the young trees of uh, um, almonds. In the Botrysphere diseases, in both walnut and almond are a sleeping giant in the orchards. And I will finish with this by thanking the group that works in the laboratory and as well the support from the walnut board and the almond board for this research and uh, growers and farm advisors. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. We have two poll questions here. Um, again, you need to take these if you want credit and pay attention to them because they will be on the final exam that's going to be emailed and posted at the end of the event. So go ahead and take some time now to fill these out and then Themis will take some time to go over the answers. So I'll give you another 45 seconds here. Okay, for the first one, uh, um, uh, it is important to know that uh, Butchusphere will not kill mature walnut trees. It may kill uh, young trees, uh, very young trees, but uh, mature trees will not die from Butchusphere. Branches and shoots can be killed, but not the entire tree. In the second one, um, they got it right. Um, so it, uh, the, uh, the killing of the trees is because of the infection of the trunk and also uh, pruning wounds that uh, are on the trunk. Uh, uh, and depends on the size of the uh, um, the canker. Uh, so pruning wounds in the canopy will not kill a, a, a almond tree. It can kill the branch that is above uh, the pruning wound, but it will not kill the entire tree. When it infects almond food, that's uh, impossible. Great. Thank you so much, Thamas. Thanks for your time this morning and for that great information. So Thank our you. last presenter is Florent Trulas, um, who will be talking about other almond wood, can almond wood canker diseases. And then we're going to stick around for about 20 minutes until the 11 o'clock hour to um, anyone who is available to stick around and would like to, to have an open discussion about how the season has gone for you guys, what your concerns are for the coming season. So I'll hand it over to Flo. All right, can you hear me and see my screen? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, well, so I'll have today some uh, complimentary information from Temis talk about uh, canker disease. And I um, like to emphasize some, some, the goal of my talk here is to also provide you tips on how to recognize this disease in the field. When you see a canker, just like on these pictures and you have several person in the orchard, one may think this is bot, one may think this is uh, Phytoceratocystis, uh, one may think this is Phytophthora. So, so one of the goal of my talk is really to emphasize on the, the necessity of having the accurate uh, disease diagnostic, which is your uh, best uh, and first steps towards uh, uh, adopting best management strategies. There's usually a lot of confusions in the field when we look at canker disease. A lot of them produce gumming. Many may occur at pruning wounds. So 
Again, before we move into disease management, I'd like also to provide uh, you with tips on how to best recognize the disease. Here is an example for, uh, for um, some almond disease in the field. Uh, most of us looking at this sort of wilting and dieback may assume quickly this is verticillium wilt. However, uh, looking closer into the symptoms, uh, we will uh, realize that you know, one disease here is a canker disease, ceratocystis canker. One is the true verticillium wilt and one is herbicide uptake. And this uh, 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 detailed diagnostic is pretty much based on more uh, in-depth uh, scrutinization of symptoms. You will notice that the vert has a specific stri streakings, a hook shape at the end of the shoot, whereas the ceratocystis cankers develop uh, gumming inside the canopy as well as a, a, a diamond-shaped canker. Similarly, looking at canker on the trunk, uh, one may assume quickly this is Phytophthora. However, looking uh, quickly, we, we can notice that uh, some uh, may be caused by abiotic fact factors such, such as acid burn and one may be uh, caused by bacterial canker. So again, one of the objectives of my talk here is to guide you through symptomology and how to be able to recognize this disease in the field, which will be your first uh, uh, approach towards adapted uh, control strategies. So with my talk, I will uh, go over some of the main fungal canker disease, true uh, fungi uh, caused canker disease. Those are the ceratocystis, the bot as they uh, uh, described already, but uh, some Eutypa cytospora canker. I will also uh, describe the aerial phytophthora canker. I'll talk briefly about foamy canker. Uh, some of this uh, silver leaf canker wood decay that we have seen uh, emerging also in, in recent years as, uh, as an issue. And I will also uh, provide comparison of this canker with another uh, canker caused by the bacteria, Pseudomonas, the bacterial canker. Uh, I will also go over some of these abiotic uh, disorder or injuries that can easily be uh, confused with uh, a true fungal canker disease. And I will describe or talk about acid burns, herbicide injury, and things like boron toxicity. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, some of these true uh, fungal canker disease. Most of these can be recognized in the field by this uh, abundant uh, gumming produced either on scaffold branches or on the trunk. Uh, a common things with this canker, it's, it's most of the time, or in, in many cases, infection may initiate at a pruning cut. Uh, this disease may lead to uh, branch dieback, scaffold branches dieback, but they all have in common that they cause this uh, vascular discoloration in the woods. Those canker uh, may be irregular in shape or V shapes. And eventually, uh, the canker can lead to, to tree death and the removal of, of, of some orchard when highly infected. Uh, so based on a personal experience and, and many uh, field uh, surveys and travels, uh, there is no doubt that a ceratocystis canker, that, that canker that's associated with shaker injury, is uh, the most prevalent uh, canker disease observed in orchard. Band canker, as Demis just mentioned, is also quite prevalent in California. And then come things like Phytophthora, which in some part of the state can actually be quite significant. We do see a lot of aerial uh, canker, Phytophthora. Mm -hmm. And then uh, maybe more importantly in the Sacramento Valley, things like Cytospora canker and Eutypa canker also uh, can be a problem. So. Uh, the, the complexity for us researchers when we are trying to develop control strategies, it's very important for us to uh, do these sort of groundwork studies to understand the diversity of fungi that can be associated with this canker. Because once we develop a, a fungicide control uh, strategy, it's important that this fungicide will be eff efficient, efficient against uh, this broad spectrum of fungal pathogen that can cause a canker. So, as Themis just mentioned, the Botrysperia uh, group uh, include at least a good dozen of species that, that can cause canker disease. Things like Cytospora, we're counting about six species in, in, in almonds and, and, and so on. So very important to first of all understand this diversity of pathogen to also adopt uh, best management practices. So uh, the first uh, canker disease and certainly the most prevalent disease I like to uh, discuss uh, briefly on is the ceratocystis canker. This is caused by a true fungus, ceratocystis destrictans, also known as ceratocystis fimbriata. 
And that canker disease is quite uh, unique, uh, definitely unique to California. We're not finding in any other almond producing regions of the world, but a canker that generally develop at uh, shaker injuries. And what's um, very unique in this uh, canker disease, it does develop this gumball, amber colored gumball that uh, most of the time occur at the margin of the canker infection. Uh, these types of wounds are generally susceptible for um, up to uh, 14 days, and most teratosis is canker are mainly active uh, during uh, the summertime uh, and not so much active during winter. So here are some uh, typical illustrations wherever you have a shaker injury, either in young trees or older tree, you will be most likely to uh, get uh, infection with uh, this ceratocystis canker. The lesion looks sort of darker, uh, black, sort of almost water sucked. Uh, they occur and initiate at, at the shaker damage, but eventually can make them way into the scaffold and then taking down um, uh, scaffolds. So uh, I think where the disease comes to be most uh, confusing in terms of field diagnostic is that uh, canker also, uh, ceratocystis canker also can occur at pruning wound. And that's generally when confusion uh, starts. Uh, however, uh, you notice again that gumballs with ceratocystis canker uh, always occur at the margin of the infection. Uh, mechanical injury also can be site of infection for the ceratocystis canker. And uh, a more rare and sort of unique expression of this disease is uh, eventually the pathogen will infect thinning cuts, leading to this um, dieback that easily can be confused with verticillium type of, type of wilt. But however, with ceratocytes uh, canker infection, you will notice this gamble at the thinning cut, as well as once to remove the bark, this diamond shaped uh, canker um, infections. So, ceratocystis canker is also. Uh, very unique as it's not like any other fungal pathogen where it's moved with uh, water and and when ceratocystis canker is spread by insect like a drosophile or fruit fly as well as sap feeding beetles and and basically when infection occur the fungus will form these uh, uh, masses of, of myceliums this mycelium contains the fruiting structure of the fungus which at the tip is a form of droplet of spores. And these are picked up by these bugs and insects and move around to fresh uh, injuries. So that's how the, the pathogen spread and, and which is very different from most of uh, the common fungal canker diseases we have normally. So management of ceratocystis, of course, is made by avoiding uh, any type of injuries. And when injury is caused, we recommend that this wound uh, is being cleaned to expose the callus and, and favor uh, sort of a natural uh, healing of the wood, uh, remove the broken bark to avoid uh, insects out of nesting below the broken bark, and uh, eventually surgery can be made to try to attempt saving a tree by removing uh, the margin of the infection. We know the fungus only occur at the margin for about half an inch depth, so also removing that infection uh, may help uh, cure the disease. Also, we recommend that uh, this trunk, after being cleaned, uh, can be uh, sprayed with uh, something like topsin to protect uh, further infection. Themis uh, talks uh, in more details about band canker and Botrysferia canker disease, so I will go uh, quickly. But something that's uh, usually associated with young trees, and especially those trees that grow really quickly, either because they are vigorous uh, cultivars or because trees receive high amount of nitrogen and water. So this fast growth produces these cracks where infection generally occurs. And again, as Thames mentioned, multiple bands may be uh, created in, in either within the same season or several years, then eventually causing to uh, the death of the tree. Uh, here, an additional picture is not always the case where only a nice uh, a straight band is formed, but we had a couple of illustrations where the canker or the gumming pattern may be a little bit more erratic, and that's often when uh, things start at a, at a pruning cut. But um, again, that's a disease that's generally uh, favored by when this uh, sprinkler, micro sprinkler, uh, wet the trunk. It's generally more problem when, 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 when trees get wet by, by irrigation. Uh, and a, a point that's interesting also, although the disease may be uh, quite uh, alarming, just looking at the gumming from the outside, when, when we look within uh, inside the trees, 
uh, trees after time or after uh, the, those first early years or, or over the years tend to sort of grow out of, of the canker generating new cambium and new xylem tissue. And it's not uncommon also for almond trees to recover from a band canker infection. Uh, Themis also mentioned briefly on a Neoschita lilium. This is a canker that also may be occurring at pruning cut, but it's an interesting uh, Botryosphaeria sort of canker that we also sort of like uh, act like a whole rod making its way through a whole split and then leading to a canker uh, in the way. These are illustration of uh, symptoms around blue time of some old mummy infected with Neoschita lilium and spur position where gumming uh, occur. And when we, you look inside uh, the wood, you will uh, find this sort of typical dark black streaking of this Neoschita lilium canker. And those uh, pathogens seems to have um, eventually emerged in recent year with uh, the general sort of warming of temperature. When you look at pathogen like Neoschitalinium, these are our, our pathogen that favor really warm temperature, like 35 degrees Celsius of, of 95 Fahrenheit. And it's very likely that the overall uh, warm and, and, and drought condition in California are, are, are favoring this new species to come in. Um, Cytospora canker, uh, again, especially in uh, the region of the Sacramento Valley, is a terrible issue for the prune industry, probably one of the main uh, limiting factor for uh, the prune industries. It's also a problem uh, in cherry in California throughout the states, but usually this disease is quite aggressive in stone fruit, leading to tree death, die back, and eventually a removal of orchards. Uh, so in region where, uh, you know, uh, much uh, prune trees and cherries are planting. It's uh, very uh, common to find this type of uh, fruiting bodies here occurring uh, on, on infected trees. And so these uh, um, infected uh, fruiting bodies will allow spores to be released. And so if you have near, nearby uh, stone fruit orchard, it's eventually possible that infection will come into almond. Uh, the symptoms of cytospora canker in almond are also sort of quite um, un unusual. The, what we see with um, pruning wound infection by cytospora canker is mainly some elongated uh, lesions that occur from the infection sites. Uh, Utypa uh, canker, we have also uh, found it in almond at uh, pruning wound and not uncommon again in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, but we also uh, see uh, quite often these Utypa cankers uh, developing at cracks uh, near the tree crotch. So as you know, Utypa dieback uh, has been a long time studied pathogen of grapevine and apricots here in California. Uh, and it's uh, definitely a pathogen of the northern portion of the states where a precipitation and humidity is much higher than the southern San Joaquin Valley, which is less likely for the fungus to to develop and, and, and produce um, a fungal fruiting structure. Uh, here are uh, sort of a classic infection of the type of uh, the canker in uh, almond. You see a crack and you see, in comparison with the other uh, disease, a lot less uh, gumming, but a few gambles uh, near the cracking area typical of the type of cankers. So uh, how uh, most of this uh, fungal pathogen gets uh, into almond? So well, any of these fungal can canker pathogens will require some type of wound, some type of uh, injury on, on the plant for them to make their way within uh, the branch or within the trunk. And so scaffold selection, which lead to all this pruning cut, is uh, certainly one of the main uh, sites of infection. Uh, we've mentioned uh, shaker damage at harvest also leads to some injuries. However, this only uh, are infected with the ceratocystis canker pathogen. They're not, they not an issue with other uh, fungal pathogen. Maintenance pruning can be an issue if you remove uh, large branches. However, we generally do not see infection by canker pa pathogen from topping or edging uh, almond or child. This is uh, not an issue. Mainly primary scaffold selection seems to be a problem. Um, so as uh, you can see, one of the common uh, thing about this fungi is all of these various group of fungal pathogens can infect at a pruning cut. You see here the Botryosphaeria, Ceratocystis, Utepa, all these fungi infect almond trees at pruning wound. So in terms of disease management, this is going to be a, a very critical, and I'll get back on this. But 
general disease cycle for these fungi, a lot of these fungal pathogens occur on uh, many ornamentals or many natural trees in riparian area. Uh, here's an illustration of black walnut bearing uh, a perithesia of, of Botryosphaeria, but any dead wood, any uh, trees uh, in the surrounding of, of, of the orchard is likely to bear or uh, to host some of this fungal pathogen. And it's a matter of uh, having rain in coordination with pruning for infection to occur. Uh, here are sort of classic biology, again, that's for Utapa, but classic uh, spore release pattern for a fungal canker pathogen is when a rain even comes, then you have sort of these uh, 24 hours or eventually longer periods of when spores are really following a rainfall. So obviously in terms of disease management, this is going to be critical and tell us to definitely avoid and not prune during uh, any raining events. Another side of infection, Themis also shares some of that, are these uh, cracks at uh, the tree crouch. And these are either caused by a, sort of a poor uh, uh, scaffold selection. And so uh, in terms of management of this canker disease, it is critical to remember the importance of scaffold selection and pruning, uh, selecting scaffolds so they have vertical uh, separations between uh, each main scaffold. A strong 45 degree angle attachment and also horizontal spacing between this main scaffold to avoid any 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 crack forming. Uh, here are a slide from 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 Roger Duncan, but uh, of different uh, training uh, systems that, that that can be caused. But it's it's most likely in California that a lot of crower will still be uh, um, uh, um, practicing uh, um, uh, severe uh, pruning, leaving many uh, pruning cuts on on the, on the trunk of the tree. And so again, there's no really curative option for this fungal pathogen. And so for disease management, it's going to be key absolutely to protect infection to develop in these young trees because once infection is in the young tree. Uh, this may eventually lead to, to tree death. And again, no, no curative options are available. So uh, for our recommendation, we'll really emphasize the importance of preventing early infection to, uh, to allow for better establishment of these trees in the orchards. So those are uh, classic uh, sort of uh, pruning systems in California. You see all the wounds that are left on the trunk. And again, so we will emphasize if any time during the orchard development, um, any application of any uh, fungicide or biocontrol agent needs to be done to protect the tree from canker disease, it should certainly be done around the primary and secondary scaffold selection. So um, over the years, we have conducted uh, many trials uh, to test uh, various uh, fungicidal biocontrol and, 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 and paste to uh, check or to figure out what would be the best uh, uh, way to protect uh, these pruning wounds. Those are generally done in, in, in commercial orchards or I mean, uh, field, field uh, that are uh, just like uh, uh, grown like commercial orchards. And um, for this, we have tested pretty much every um, uh, fungicides or that are available from the various frag groups. We also uh, tested various biocontrol agents. We tried some oils. We tried a uh, sealant. And again, because of the diversity of fungal uh, canker pathogen, it was very important for us in our trial uh, testing these various products to uh, um, uh, in, uh, to um, uh, have uh, this broad of uh, diversity of fungal pathogens included in a trial because we want to make sure that any a product that will be used will have a broad spectrum efficacy to protect these pruning wounds against the broad uh, array of canker pathogens. So uh, it came uh, very obvious over the years with some of the, our first uh, fungicide trial that uh, uh, Topsinhem was definitely one of our uh, best uh, product. Theophanate methyl allow uh, in, in most of our uh, trials any, anywhere between 80% to 100% disease control. So that's one of the first product that was really highlighted in our trials. Uh, but we also looked at um, mixed fungicide or other fungicide. What um, this is sort of summarize uh, some of the findings we had over the years, but all the time seem uh, provided um, great control. We were, we were also really excited to find that some natural uh, biocontrol agents such as uh, Trichoderma product also provided 
great control a control that was as as uh, um, good as as topsin up to 80 90 percent sometime of the of, uh, pruning protections uh we had an array of uh fungicide that also provided um, moderate efficacy. And now um, we are particularly, particularly looking at rhyme fungicide that is known to have some systemic activity. So we're looking closely into this and this will be uh, very attractive to grower if, if, if this fungicide can be applied by fertigation and provide control, that will be something also very, uh, very exciting. So we're looking more closely into, into rhyme. Uh, so I'd like to take a few minutes to um, I talk about these um, biocontrol agents. Uh, biocontrol agents are usually other uh, fungal uh, agents. Here in that case, we're talking about a trichoderma. And this pathogen, if you mix together with, uh, uh, with this, this, this biocontrol agent, if you mix them together with a pathogen like Utaparlata into a petri dish, you will see uh, quickly enough over time that this pathogen act as a competitor and eventually might co-parasite against, against the pathogen. So it was quite um, interesting for us to uh, give it a try in almond to protect uh, these this pruning wounds. And uh, what's um, really exciting about the use of a, of a fungal organism like a trichoderma for protection of pruning wood is if a chemical will mainly only protect and, and act in that um, main upper uh, thinner layers uh, at the pruning cut, trichoderma uh, uh, control uh, by your fungicide are actually allowed to colonize a wound and provide long-term uh, protection of, of a pruning cut. So very exciting products. Uh, we uh, have work uh, to try to improve um, uh, the efficacy of this uh, trichoderma product. In that case here, the product is named Vintech. But we mix the product with a spreader sticker. In this case, we use new film P. And what we notice is when the trichoderma uh, biofungicide is mixed with uh, one of these uh, spreader sticker, we also get uh, a great efficacy for pruning wood protection. And again, in all our trial, usually this Vintech product was uh, uh, providing a, a disease control that was up to the level of topsin. Here are some uh, last trial we conducted in, uh, in, in Colusa uh, County where with, with France. And you can see that uh, our non-treated con control has up to 75% infection where anything like this biocontrol agent of topsin, we are below almost the 10% of, of, of pruning wound infection. Uh, so some of the, the work we're conducting now is how is uh, will be the best approach to uh, to apply this this trichoderma product. Uh, there is um, again no doubt that this pruning large pruning cut on uh, on the trunk is what we want to product. So there is a, a, a eventually a, a, you know a possibility of using a targeted uh, a spot a sprayers like as a manual backpack sprayer or electric brush spot sprayer. But uh, we're looking carefully also now in, in, in using a conventional blast air system uh, to um, facilitate the application of the product. But one issue with this uh, using your conventional sprayers is that this may already have some residual uh, of fungicide. And of course, because we're dealing with a trichoderma, which is another uh, fungal organism, they may risk a toxicity from, from, from leftover from, uh, from, um, from, from the, the, the sprayer. Uh, we also looked at uh, when pruning should be made, when, when is the likelihood of a pruning wood to be less susceptible to infection. So we looked at September, compare September, October, November, December, and January pruning. And for each of these uh, month of pruning, we looked at the duration of pruning wound susceptibility or how long will it take for a pruning wound to heal. What, uh, again, we work with uh, multiple uh, fungal pathogens, but what was very obvious uh, in our trial is that generally a pruning wound is susceptible for about uh, two weeks. In most of our pruning, what we see is a significant uh, drop of pruning wound susceptibility after two weeks. Uh, we looked at the various months of pruning. Of all, in some cases, uh, uh, pruning with susceptibility extended up to eight weeks. But it was um, that was a trial actually conducted in Colusa County. It was very interesting to look at the January pruning, where uh, no infection was really possible after one week. So really, a smaller overall duration of pruning with susceptibility when uh, pruning was uh, made in in January. 
So this tells us that uh, if uh, prolinguant susceptibility is uh, anywhere between one to two weeks, it's very important to apply the protectant right at pruning. And just with one application, uh, we will be okay to have our pruning with protecting and no need to repeat applications. Uh, general common sense um, uh, management practice, uh, practices for canker disease, it's very important to avoid again wetting these trunks, removing uh, dead stumps, removing any dead wood around the orchard that may carry fungal fruiting bodies. Uh, but just uh, in summary, uh, for this management of fungal canker disease, it's again very critical to prevent the disease establishment in the early years of the trees and the orchards. Uh, and for this, it's very critical to protect those large pruning wound on the trunk following primary and secondary scaffold selection. Something I really forgot to mention, but these pruning sealers and acrylic paint sealants are not uh, greatly working for pruning with protection. So I would recommend to avoid any paint or, or sealants, but rather work with uh, either things like Topsin or this Trachoderma product. Of course, avoid pruning trees when it's raining, uh, remove the dead wood, avoid uh, sprinkler irrigations that wet the trees. Eventually, if an infection is detected, remedial surgery can be practiced, meaning the branch can be removed. But for this, it is always important to cut several inches inside the clean wood when an infected uh, branch is, um, is, is removed. Uh, a few words. In the last uh, years, we had detected several orchard highly infected with the silver leaf. So we're talking here about a sort of a canker, but also wood decay pathogen. It's a basidiomycete mushroom type, as illustrated here on, on, on these pictures. He also infects that pruning one. So that's something in common that with these other canker diseases, uh, silver leaf chondrostrium can also infect pruning wounds. And it's easily uh, detectable in the orchard as an infected tree due to toxin production, produce these really light colored silvery uh, leaves compared to uh, green leaf in healthy trees. Uh, Jim Adoskavich had done some work in the early, uh, early days about prevention of pruning wound infection by Condostria realm and also demonstrated that Trichoderma product work, work great to prevent infection from, from um, uh, silver leaf. Silver leaf is quite aggressive. Um, and the, the fungus may grow several feet during a growing season. These are infections that occur all the way up into the scaffold all the way down the trunks and all the way uh, pretty much down uh, the rootstock. Uh, so really fast growing uh, pathogen, but something that we have uh, spotted um, uh, uh, more, uh, more commonly in the last few years. Uh, in late infection uh, stages, uh, the pathogen, uh, the, the trees will look like the sort of almost uh, silvery color, but with necrotic lesions on leaves that also look very similar to either a potassium deficiency or severe nitrogen deficiency. Phytophthora uh, canker, very briefly, I think the goal here is to mainly have some comparison between what aerial phytophthora cankers look like compared to this uh, common uh, true fungal canker disease. Um, aerial canker with phytophthora generally occur at uh, the tree crotch. So if we know that phytophthora canker at our um, soil bone pathogen causing root and crown rot, there are cases where infection with phytophthora occur at the tree crotch. And this is due because of poor scaffold selection, eventually a water pockets may remain on the tree following rain. And it um, uh, has been shown that following harvest, the spores that are on the ground from Phytophthora may be blown up into the canopy and then washed off into this pocket, which with the formation of cracks will lead to infection and abundant gumming. So this is actually quite a severe issue. Greg Brown at UC Davis is working on it, but we had several um, cold where um, high numbers of trees are found to be infected with uh, sort of new species also. Uh, being detected in normal. So uh, also a severe problem. Uh, and so the way to um, make an accurate diagnostic and separate the Phytophthora canker from Ceratocystis is with Phytophthora canker, the canker uh, gumming pattern is usually um, throughout the infected area. And this canker grow very, uh, very quickly. Uh, an entire scaffold may be colonized with Phytophthora uh, during a growing season. Where with ceratocystis canker, again, the gumming pattern always occurs at the margin of the infection, and the fungus is a much uh, uh, slowly growing uh, species. Again, Phytophthora canker gumming throughout the infection area, 
and ceratocystis canker gumming only at the margin. Uh, Phytophthora canker may be also uh, found in these young trees, and usually the issues there is when uh, um, too much water is being placed at the base of the tree for, for too long, when the emitter is right at the base of the trees, or eventually when the bud union uh, oftentimes is buried underground, and so that those are perfect conditions for infection with Phytophthora to take off. Uh, general uh, words on uh, management for Phytophthora. Again, be careful of not burying uh, the bud union below ground. Proper scaffold selection is also uh, critical. And uh, overall, uh, just from um, previous work by, by uh, Dr. Greg Brown and, 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 and discussion with, with growers in the field, it seems like phosphites application, uh, two application with one when the, the leaves are fully developed in the spring in April and another application foliar uh, in uh, after harvest, late September, early October uh, provide a good efficacy to either prevent or, or, or reduce the ongoing infections. For me, canker, just a few words. This is our picture from the almond doctor, David Dole, a very impressive uh, bright orange coming on the trees. Uh, these are some personal pictures and personal observation. It has been uh, my uh, interpretation that uh, my experience that uh, foamy canker is not a disease of its own, but generally a secondary response to an infection by another issue like phytophthora or eventually an abiotic stress. But foamy canker is generally a physiological secondary response uh, to uh, generally a phytophthora infection. Uh, bacterial canker, just I will illustrate here to, to, to sort of know how to uh, distinguish a bacterial canker from a fungal canker, but usually with bacterial canker, the, the cankers are very irregular in shape, uh, sort of superficial, but also forming this uh, uh, speckle and, and, and spotty uh, infection sites. Um, quickly, I like to move into some of these abiotic injury or stress that can be uh, easily confused with a canker disease. Here are the case of um, glufosinate uh, damage on the trunk. This was originally reported by uh, David Dole and, and Brad Hanson. It's something we see uh, actually uh, quite commonly when uh, trees are sprayed after uh, removal of the cottons and trees haven't had times to sort of uh, strengthen the, the, their, their, their bark. Uh, the, the symptoms will look like all these uh, gumballs on the trunks and uh, can easily be confused with something like, um, like band canker. However, if you, if you test this sort of dead area with a hammer or something, you'll notice that the wood becomes really hard uh, and that's sort of a field uh, 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 tips to uh, try to diagnose these issues. Um, acid burns we've seen in orchards where sometimes acids to uh, uh, sulfuric acid used to apply uh, to, to reduce the pH, pH on an orchard. If, if the, the, the acid is poured too closely from a root, you will have this uptake leading to a canker up the trunk that also could be confused with canker pathogen. Other acids, such as those that are used to um, uh, clean irrigation lines, again, if this acid comes uh, too abundantly too much on one root, you will see this uptake here on the roots leading to uh, canker looking like infection in the trunk. Uh, boron toxicity also, something that probably all seen when, when uh, uh, in this issue occur, you will see cracking and gumming on the trunk uh, or on the bark uh, of the trees that can be confused with canker uh, disease. But usually when you remove uh, you know, the bark below this infection, you'll see sort of a spotty area, uh, a, a little darkened that are uh, certainly different from the general appearance of a canker. So uh, with this, uh, I'd like to thank you and thanks the Almond Board and uh, CDFA for funding this research. Uh, I do have a survey that will follow up that I hope you, you can fill up. Uh, sometimes some of these uh, CDFA agencies require uh, a follow up on the impact of, of, of our research. So I will appreciate if, um, if uh, the survey can be filled up after, after my, my talk. And with this, thank you. All right, so there are two questions here on the screen and we are dropping Flo's survey into the chat. I'm gonna drop that now. So please copy and paste that and open it in a browser so that once you're done taking the poll, you can take that survey. Um, 
that would be very helpful for him. And then again, you're taking this exam uh, questions to get your GPR credit and it will be probably on the test that's gonna be emailed and linked afterwards. So um, go ahead and take that exam and then go ahead and copy and paste the survey that's in the chat and open and paste it into another browser so that when you're done, you can fill out that survey. Okay, so what pruning practice is most susceptible to infection by canker pathogen? Uh, I've uh, described this a lot in my talk, but it's definitely, as most, most um, responders um, uh, have said, it's the primary and secondary scaffold selection. It's very critical to emphasize uh, protections at this early stage of the orchard development. And then um, finally, what um, are some of the common biological control that in our case or studies have shown great efficacy to protect pruning wood. It's uh, definitely uh, the trichoderma product that allow uh, colonization of this pruning cut and, and great competition against any fungal canker pathogen. So. Great, thank you so much, Flo. Thanks to all our presenters um, from this morning. So we have just a, a few more quick things before um, you all go. So Kelly, we have that other um, uh, set of questions to evaluate the webinar for the morning, yeah? Yes, so I just dropped another um, link in the chat. That's the evaluation. It's really, really important that um, you take the time to fill this out. It helps um, planning for future events. It helps guide um, some of the speakers, you know, on what they should be looking at. Um, and it'll be helpful for you. So if you take, can take the time to take that next link, copy and um, paste it into your um, another browser. And again, I'll email all this out to you again today. So you'll have it as well, but if you can take the time and copy and paste it and fill it out, that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, that would be fantastic, folks. We're really just, you know, it's even harder doing this stuff over Zoom. We're just talking into a void. So we don't know, <laughs> we can't see whether you're looking at your phone and not paying attention to us. Um, so it's really helpful if you fill out those evaluations for us to know whether this has been effective, whether we should do more stuff like this. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, helps us do our job better. So I think that, yeah, both of those are very quick surveys. Sure would appreciate you filling them out. Um, just real quick before we sign off here, there's a couple of upcoming opportunities for more learning, more uh, DPR credits. Uh, so Luke Millian is leading a discussion actually quite just this afternoon on um, freeze damage and walnuts, how to avoid it in the future, what we've seen in the recent past. I'll put those links in the chat as well. Um, the nitrogen management course that UC has started offering over video just opened and will be open till the end of the year if you need CCA credits for nitrogen management planning. Nematode uh, field day, that's a two days for almonds and for walnuts, which will be down near Fresno at Kearney. Um, and then as Franz mentioned, two, um, two opportunities for orchard spray tune-ups and spray safe stuff uh, in January. So that's just um, what's coming up in the very near future, but you can subscribe to um, follow. Uh, if you go to sacvalleyorchards.com, you can subscribe to get an email every month with upcoming events. You can also follow us on Twitter at sacorchards.com and we put uh, reminders of all events there as well. So um, I will put these links and registration links in the chat right now if you're interested in any of these upcoming events. Uh, fantastic. Um, big thanks to Kelly for keeping us on track and all together organizing everybody. It's really, yeah, herding academics is like herding cats. So thank you, Kelly. Um, thanks again to all our speakers and um, hope everybody has a great rest of their day.